So welcome everybody to the tool chains and kernel micro conference in LPC 2000, uh, 2021. So let me go very fast, very quickly through the, the default slides that you have seen like 20 times already. Okay, sponsors, Facebook, um, IBM, thank you very much, ARM, Microsoft, nice to see you here, Amazon, Netflix, Red Hat, Colabora, for the nice USB gift sponsor, you know, speaker gifts. VMware for the t-shirts, thank you very much. The Linux Foundation for the conference services, which work very well, so thank you too. Anti-harassment policy, be nice with other people, then we all will be happy. Uh, housekeeping, this is the last day of the conference, so, uh, well, I mean, everyone knows this already as well. The planning committee, uh, thank you very much to you all. We know the pain, we appreciate your pain. Um, so I will, I wanted to uh, say something very fast. This is a LPC microconference, meaning that we are not gonna have talks here, <laughs> or that's the idea. In theory, um, you are supposed to be using like one, maybe two, maybe three slides per activity. Uh, I have seen the presentations, that's not going to happen like that, but let's try to have as much discussion as possible. So you have a problem, you need the kernel hackers to, to fix that problem, and then you want to discuss about it. So, because that's what it's supposed to be. So let's go, let's start with the first one, which is Rust in the kernel. So this is Miguel Ojeda, and thank you very much. Okay, can you see me? Yeah, I think so, right? Yep, sounds good. So, uh, well, this presentation, as, uh, as uh, the, you were seeing, is uh, basically, uh, basically all of it is backup slides, uh, and I wanted to have as much discussion as possible because in the other talks we had, basically we took most of the time uh, explaining things, so for this one we wanted to have as much discussion as possible and leave uh, as much time as possible. So I, the slides are just uh, the, basically the questions about the tool chain that we have had so far and uh, the ones that I put in the abstract, uh, all the questions that uh, we have. I have answered for the, all of those in the, in the backup slides. Uh, and we can go through them. Uh, but again, if somebody wants to discuss something else, uh, please let us know. Uh, these are the questions and I will go through this. Uh, but again, if uh, somebody wants to uh, uh, discuss anything else uh, that appears in these slides, basically, that I am going through it. Um, some of these we discuss uh, at the beginning of LPC, some of these we discuss uh, in the in the Clam Big Linux uh, uh, meetup uh, last week as well, uh, also in Cangrejos. So there is uh, a lot of things we can discuss about the toolchain. Um, these are basically all the topics and all the things that we have. Uh, so I will start answering basically those basic questions and then uh, ask uh, any question or anything you have uh, in, about that. So the first question uh, is uh, which uh, particular Rust toolchain uh, is needed right now? And uh, to answer this, we need a bit of uh, background in the sense that uh, Rust, as you know, is, uh, is a language that exists plus that has some uh, features, but there are some features that are unstable, what they call unstable. So instead of releasing, uh, for example, an, an extension to the language, um, like in C, like uh, GCC does, for example, they extend the language and then they, I hope, uh, support the extensions that they release uh, forever, right? Uh, in the Rust language, uh, they prefer to have like a transition period or a beta period or a testing period of a feature. So they release a feature um, as unstable, right? And this feature can only be accessed to, to the, in, in the Nile compiler. So you cannot use that feature in the stable compiler in principle. So, in the kernel, we need some unstable features because there is some. Um, sorry, got uh, okay. That, that's a sorry. So we have uh, in the in the kernel we have um, we need some features from from the Rust compiler, both in the language, in the library, uh, even in some tools. Um, in the tooling, uh, we need a few. Uh, uh, someone is typing. Okay, uh, we need some common features. So, but at the same time, we need to use a stable compiler. We want to use a stable compiler. So there is this uh, 
tension between uh, the features, the NSM features, and the, and the and compilers, uh, and, and uh, what uh, should we use, at least for the beginning. So for the moment, what we have done, and this is basically the answer to the question, is what we have done is use a stable feature with a scape hatch that allows you to, to, to use unstable features, and therefore the, the tool that we use right now is the stable one. So you only need to have the, the stable, uh, the stable uh, tool chain installed. Uh, but we use it as if it was a nice bit, so to speak, because we use unstable features. We have a question already. Lucas uh, asks, where can we read about compilation process in Rust? How does this uh, process work compared to C preprocessing pre compilation linking? OK, so I have some slides about that. Um, let me see. I can arrive there. Um, well, um, well, we can use this because uh, that allows us to also explain the. So, in, in in Rust, the compilation process basically, first of all, you have a translation unit, and a translation unit, as you know, in C is your C file basically, plus all the headers that you are including through the preprocessor, etc. etc. Et uh, in Rust, the equivalent is the, I mean, the translation unit in Rust is a crate. So, um, so a crate which can contain many files uh, is, the, is a compilation unit. So far in the kernel, we have, uh, and I, let me go first to this slide to explain that. One second, I write there. It would be nice to have like an index here to be able to do these kind of discussions to jump to a particular slide. So here you see the, the grades. So each grade here will be like a completion unit in, in the C side, right? Um, so as you can see, we have uh, one which is called kernel, which doesn't mean it's a new kernel. This is just the place where we put all the abstraction for the kernel. So you can read it as the, 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 the Rust abstraction for the kernel. And this is a single completion unit, a single translation unit, um, which uh, of course makes it uh, so that it will grow and probably we will need to uh, split it, right? Uh, but that's basically how it works. And in the kernel, what we do uh, for the compilation, we don't use cargo. And what we do is uh, we compile these crates uh, of course, since they are completion units, we compile them individually. So you compile the kernel crate on one side, you compile the built-in crate on, on another side, you compile also the core crate, you compile also the alloc crate. Uh, some of these depend on, on others. Uh, something like, uh, like uh, what? Uh, oh no, so like, like the headers in C, uh, you could say. It's not, it's, not, it's not the same, but what I mean is that to compile the alloc crate, you need to have compiled the core crate first. Uh, so you need to have it available already compiled. So uh, it's not just some, I mean, uh, there is some things that require some metadata uh, from the other crate, uh, but that metadata is basically what would you, what you would have in the, in the, in the header in a, C, in a C program. So there is some metadata that the, other, the one crate needs to, to be able to compile and link to the, to the other crate, right? Or just, let's say just compile to the other crate. So you build core, then you build alloc and build teams, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally you build the core uh, sorry, the, the kernel crate. And after the kernel crate is built, then we go to all the drivers, for example, or all the modules that are written in, um, in, in the kernel, and they link into that. So they need, uh, or they, they depend on the kernel crate. Let's see. Uh, there are other details, like the bindings crate, the bindings crate we can also discuss, and binding, I have a question about that as well. Uh, but yeah, uh, basically there is uh, some dependencies that you can see here, more or less, uh, simplified. And uh, you will have to go step by step. Um, and for the Rust support, uh, we did it like this because initially, long time ago, what people was doing was the original support was, or what how, how people have done external modules for the kernel, even in Rust or in other languages, is to build uh, like a static library or, a, or an object file or whatever, completely independent from the kernel, as if it was uh, with anything, all the dependencies there in that file or in that uh, archive. And then uh, just create a key from that. But of course, in the kernel, we don't want to do that. We want to share everything. Uh, we want to share everything in the, in the, in the, in the. I mean, all the abstractions for the for the kernel C APIs and all the core. So instead of repeating core analog in every single module, uh, we don't want to repeat all that support, which is actually quite. Uh, I mean, takes some space. So we don't want to repeat all that. We want to have a single place in the kernel which contains the Rust support. And that is what we call the Rust support option in key config. Uh, so if you enable that, you will get core, you will get alloc, you will get the kernel crate, the built-in crate, the binding crate that you see here. Uh, this macro crate, uh, ignore it because the macro crate is, 
is uh, like a plugin for the compiler, so it's not for 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 all that purpose. Uh, not it. And then when the RAS support is enabled, then you can enable all the other modules, which is depend on that. So they can find the other crates. Uh, for example, if you are uh, compiling a driver, it will need for sure the kernel crate, and the kernel crate on top uh, it will depend on the others, etc., etc. So that's basically a completion process that we we follow. Um, there's also one gen, but we, I will go back to that. Uh, please keep the question coming because it's, um, it's basically the most uh, interesting part, uh, I think. Uh, so we have another uh, question. How can the Linux kernel community, who are interested in Rust, help accelerate uh, the DC implementation to ensure that Rust has the same portability and diversity of tools and support as the current kernel implementation language? Encouraging cooperation between Rust, Rust-C, Rust Foundation, and the new toolchain. Participating in the new tools in development and are providing funding for developers, etc. So this is from David, which is uh, from the DCC steering uh, committee. If I'm correct, uh, we discussed this uh, yesterday a bit. Um, basically, I think uh, without again getting into too much detail, um, we need for, for the from the kernel's perspective, at least for, from the project perspective, we need some features uh, from Rust, from the language, from the compiler, from the tooling, etc. If Rust is going to become a language in the GCC, in the, in the compiler collection, then uh, we will also need support there. And uh, we hope that we we can support as much as possible uh, the alternate uh, backends. So, for example, I can also explain uh, that because it was also a question here. So, let me first perhaps uh, clarify what are the how the how the different frontends uh, that we have right now. Let me go to the slides. Sorry. Ah, uh, no, this will be in the end. Or, sorry, here. Yes. So there is, there is uh, right now, or at least since the beginning of Rust, they implemented, not in the beginning, beginning, but basically in the, in the after 1.0 of the compiler, let's say, they have been using what they call Rust C code general LVM, which is the backend that, uh, so they have a front end that is everything Rust, et cetera, et cetera. And then in the, in the compiler, they have the backend, which is LVM. This is the main one, it's the one that has been used, uh, is used everywhere, basically. Uh, but there are two projects, well, there are more projects. There is also another project for bootstrapping the Rust compiler from C, C++, if I don't remember correctly. But the other two main projects uh, that they have funded, most of these projects have funded, as you can see here in the slide, there are two different projects. There is Rust GCC, which is a um, new frontend for the GCC compiler. So this would be like, a, like the Ada frontend, uh, GNAT, or I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, or the Fortran frontend, etc., etc., the D frontend. So this will be like a Rust frontend, GCCRS. Uh, it's just it's, it's coming along very nicely. We have a rough estimate from the developers, I think. We have the developer here, uh, if I saw correctly, for, uh, yes, we have Philip here. So oh, yeah, uh, Rust, uh, is, uh, spec yeah, Philip, go ahead, please, go ahead and answer that if you want. Oh, I guess. Um, yeah. So I think to get to like a viable sort of uh, working compiler, we're hoping in a region of like, you know, year, year and a half sort of time, hopefully that next Christmas, maybe all going well, Santa might be helpful. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's some, plenty of work to get to that. Probably some way kernel developers can help is if you have the short list of language extensions that you're relying on currently for unstable features, like having having that as a short list somewhere, and then uh, providing providing that short list to the folks working on the GCC implementations will go a long way, um, particularly towards getting probably maybe unstable features more stabilized. Right? You know, it always helps having a second implementation take a look and kind of hammer out details and say, you know, these are the trickier parts of implementation or not. I think like inline assembler is one that I'm very curious about. Like I had seen something like one of the Rust features that would use like LLVM's pseudo language for for in, for like inline assembler, like that's not gonna fly kind of thing. Um, though I think if we take like the, the you know, the, the more expected GNU C extension for inline ASM and rewrite that into something different, like that might be a little tough sell to kernel developers, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, so, so for the unstable features, at least for the ones in the kernel that we are releasing right now, which is still up in the air, so we can perhaps remove some of them. Some of the others are just nice to have, so it depends on which uh, unstable feature we're talking about. But we have this list uh, 
the I can start the limit this is the second issue in GitHub. Uh, one second. We have this issue that I will put in right now, and you will see well a lot of things. So don't get uh, don't get too. Uh, Right, so Josh has a point that he's putting in the notes here. He says there's a pro project called Rocket, I guess. He says they use Rust nightly for a long time, but they kept a short list of nightly features they needed and specific reasons why, and that helped them kind of meet in the middle so that they're now able to build their project on stable Rust. Which uh, I put it in the chat if you can, because otherwise, just in case it breaks, uh, if you, someone can put it in the server notes, so I don't have to switch the tab to the... I put the link to the uh, unstable feature we are using in the different parts of the language, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Some of them we can remove, some of them, um, yeah, I think we should have. Uh, some of them uh, we are trying to use only unstable features, or we hope, I mean, we are trying hard to only use unstable features in the abstractions, so in the subsystems, not in the leaf modules, uh, because uh, the idea is that, uh, well, even if there is, there is something that uh, doesn't get stabilized or is changed or removed, in a feature uh, version of the of the compiler, we can easily change that, and we don't need to change the majority of the code. Uh, but still, there is a couple of features that we use in the in drivers as well. Um, yeah, so that's those are the features. Uh, and just to finish the this slide, basically, uh, please continue or, or just to stop me, uh, David. If you want to, well, no, I mean, thanks very much, Miguel, for this this no, you know, thanks this, to this you overview. For no, no, and then the great discussion yesterday afternoon, and and for I mean, and also this you know having this wonderful session. Uh, as as you mentioned at the beginning, there are these you know Rust is evolving very rapidly, and there are you know features that are stable or features that are unstable, and we definitely want to encourage. Uh, I mean, the, the two issues. I mean, one is just the communication because uh, you know we're not trying to create a different language. I mean, there has been a lot of history of GCC with the various extensions, but it's not a matter of trying to, to break mm -hmm. rest or, or take it over or to, you know, distract it. I mean, we definitely want to ensure that, you know, with this rest and then Philip and, and the team at Embicosm are, you know, very strongly connected with the, the rest community. There's a lot of communication that we don't want to start creating a different language or having the, the Linux kernel use a different variant of rest. I mean, there's no much. So it's a matter of, you know, how we can ensure, you know, this communication and that, um, the you know GCC you know is not used as a as a vector to to try to you know change the language or use something else in the Linux kernel or as or as a you know creates tension between uh, the Linux kernel community and the the Rust development community. So I mean so that's one is to, you know, to ensure and hopefully the Linux kernel people will you know be uh, you know you know cooperative with this and then you know be in, involved in you know not trying to sort of pit these implementations against each other. Um, but also just as, as you mentioned, you know, how to encourage it, as I, I mentioned there, to, to have the, the Linux kernel developers and their, you know, their, their corporations, their, their businesses to, to get engaged as well with the GNU tool chain development because it's so important to the Linux kernel and the whole Linux ecosystem. So, if, you know, to provide additional resources um, to help ensure that the faster that this uh, GCC, I mean, both of these implementations are, are available and robust and ready, the, the, the faster that it's uh, practical to have Rust inside the, the Linux kernel and especially available and used by Linux distributions and the, the entire um, deployment mechanism and, and the, the ecosystem, the other way of describing it. Yeah, I think like, like uh, we discussed yesterday, uh, anything we can do from the kernel perspective to help uh, either TCC or, or uh, we have, for example, one idea is, uh, the mainly list the tool chains, mainly list. There is not a lot of people, I think, in the tool chain. Nick, you can correct me if I'm wrong. There is only a few people in the tool chains, uh, mainly list right now. But uh, we could invite both GCC developers and the, uh, the Rust uh, community as well, and the, and, and the compiler folks from the main compiler, basically, the current main compiler. I know because since you are working uh, here, Philip, on, on that, I, I, every time I say the main compiler, what I mean is the, the current main compiler. So I'm going to get me wrong. <laughs> So we could get people in that mailing list. Uh, for but the mailing list, list that really exists, right? Yes, yes, it is already six. Uh, I can uh, can send the link. Yeah, we we have to subscribe to that. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. 
So there's only I think nine people or ten people only. So we should really increase the number and have folks from Rust as well. Uh, at least if we make it into the kernel, uh, but they can already join. Uh, I think uh, quite faster. Um, I'd be interested in joining that mailing list as well. I'd be interested to see what the conversation's like. I think um, I don't know if this is the right like place to talk about this or anything like that. But the um, from one thing in my perspective down the line that I'd be concerned with would be the idea of um, language versioning. I know Rust does use Rust editions and stuff, but I'm not sure how how that's going to work. Given that you know Rust 2018 edition, then subsequent from that, we have you know all the st the features that get added over time, you know, and things like I'm not sure how that's going to work out. But um, at the minute, it's not really on my radar right now. But it's something down the line that I will have to start thinking about how to handle that. I'm so on the sure uh, uh, well, there is also the, what is more concerning, I guess, is rather than editions, which are more, I think they are supposed to be more or less easily forward compatible, it, not completely, but at least more, more or less it should be easy to transition. There is also a feature like, like one we use already in, in, the, in the kernel, which is the unsafe uh, operation in unsafe function, which is uh, the one for not assuming, not implicitly assuming an unsafe function body is an unsafe block. So you can have, uh, so basically the idea is that you explicitly mark all unsafe blocks, even if they, if they are in an unsafe function, because the concepts are orthogonal. And the concepts are orthogonal and they, they in the language right now, it's not like that. So um, thank you, Mark, for, for putting that. So one, that's flag, if you enable it, like we do in the kernel, which we deny it, so it's basically like W error uh, for those uh, that are new to Rust. We use W error for some warnings that are like for style and things like that. But this one in particular, basically changes language because things that, I mean, things are not going to compile uh, anymore uh, in, the, in, the, in that variation of the language so far. So I hope uh, we can also discuss with our upstream trust to get that to be the main language in our future edition. I think everyone agrees that it's a good idea to separate the, the concept or at least a lot of people agree. So there's also the concern about like variations of flags to the compiler that basically make, make a split a bit on the, on the language. Or the, and another thing we have is a document that we discussed yesterday also with David. You received uh, because I, I look for an email. You received, okay. Uh, I, I, I we have a, a, a document uh, with all these projects that uh, are going on uh, that we would need. Um, uh, it's intended for companies, so companies perhaps want to put some funding there. And we have a document. If somebody in the in the in the in the room uh, is from a company or wants to support with funding, uh, just let me know and I will send you the link to the document uh, with all the projects that we have. Uh, Miguel, I, want, I, want, I wanted to ask or raise two questions that came up in the chat from Mark. Mm -hmm. um, one is asking about, are there currently any use of procedural macros in the Rust kernel patches? Yes. And then the other question is, does BindGen rely on libclang? The answer to that is yes. Um, but can it be made more robust by relying on dwarf or CTF to generate Rust types? Or are there features that rely on C header parsing? Mm -hmm. which feels more fragile than dwarf in CTF. So, sorry, Mark, uh, I completely forgot the, <laughs> to, to keep with it. Uh, so for the procedural macros, as you see here, this macros create is, is a procedural macro. Uh, as you know, uh, procedural macros are like uh, separate. They are not like the Rust, uh, sorry, the macros by example, which are more like the simple processor that is integrated in the same pass, let's say, or the same completion. Um, I don't know how to, how to say it, but basically it's like a different, a completely different a a translation unit. It's like a, compiler plugin. And in the official uh, or in the main uh, Rust compiler, these are uh, like a shared library that the compiler loads after compiling, compiling it, and we do use them. Uh, for the ECCRS, uh, I think we discussed Philip and myself this uh, in one email or something. Um, I think, uh, yeah, we will need the procedural macros, I think, for some things. Uh, it will, I mean, um, I don't think yeah. we want to uh, skip on that. But it would be nice if instead of using a server library or something like that, you could have something better than the main compiler. So that we could have procedural macros that don't crash the, the main the, the compiler if, uh, if they... If they <laughs> the, um, as far as I know, the, the procedural macro thing is like a, a separate create. So in theory, if we're able to compile that create, we hopefully get the support for free. All going well. <laughs> that's, that's my talk because um, I know MRC had to do the same thing and they had to make some slight changes to it, obviously. But hopefully, we can keep those changes to a minimum. Was sort of my thoughts on it so far, but we'll have to see when we get to that point and middle and start next year. 
Yeah. We, we, I mean, right now we don't use a lot of procedural macros, but uh, uh, we, I mean, we could even do some fancy things on the procedural macros. Instead of doing something on the build system, on like individual steps in the make file, in the, the kernel make file, what we could do is have procedural macros that actually like create files and compile C files, uh, generate, for example, the module macro, uh, where we declare a kernel module. Um, we could, instead of doing what we are doing now, which is basically a, a complex thing that we, I didn't really like it. I prefer that we generate a C file with the macros of C, reuse those macros so that we don't have to re-implement them in Rust, and then uh, compile that C file that links into the rest. And that, that way we can reuse that. So for that, for example, we could use either an independent step, I guess, or a procedural macro. Uh, and a procedural macro would be better because then it looks like Rust, it's Rust, and it's everything much easier, I guess. But then, yes, we need to create files from the procedural macros, and I don't know whether that is actually uh, intended to be supported. Right now it works, right? But uh, I don't know if it is, uh, like, for example, if you create a, a you put the procedural macros in an independent thing and uh, in another process and you sandbox the process or something like that, then those kind of things perhaps don't work. So yeah, there's some discussion there. But uh, yeah, the other question was, does Bindgen rely on lib clunk? And this is one big, big uh, thing. And yes, it does. Let me go quickly. I think like one thought on that is, um, it's probably much faster to parse header files than it is to have the compiler generate the debug info and then pull type information out of that. Um, yeah, we, we also discussed that uh, last week, uh, Nick, uh, and also uh, David uh, Malcolm uh, also told me uh, to look into uh, Libre to, to perhaps uh, do that. Because even if uh, the question here is more related to GCC build kernels, because if we are building the kernel with GCC and we want to have everything built with GCC and not mix uh, GCC and plan uh, things, either we need a binding backend uh, that uses GCC somehow. Uh, we also discussed that. Uh, but the other idea is to, uh, like Nick and, and David suggested, this, instead of making this backend, or even if we use that backend, but have uh, use uh, at least a way to check that the EBI is correct. So instead of doing a new backend with GCC, we still use the plan. We keep everything as is, but at least we know if the at least we know if the if the if the ABA is the same. So even if we are using a different parser, basically, uh, we more or less know that uh, the output is correct. Um, there is also a question whether we could not use a binding generator and have the things written by hand. But the problem is that then we have to duplicate all the headers uh, manually. And then we also have to use conditional completion and we have to keep that in sync with the C side. And this is, I think it's, uh, it's not, uh, it's not worth There's it. a, another question um, yeah. from Josh about discussion around unsafe function versus unsafe blocks. Their Rust compiler developers are considering a change in this in future versions and it would be helpful to have feedback from kernel developers on this. Yeah. Um, and then I think in the chat, there's also a note maybe about calling inline functions, which I don't know if you covered. Uh, yeah, so inline functions look like this. So have, yes, I mean, this is, sorry, there is not even time. To, <laughs> so sorry that uh, it's a lot of things to discuss. So that's why we encourage you, if you're interested in Rust, please come to the meeting. We have uh, monthly uh, meetings, informal meetings, and also technical meetings if you want to follow the effort. But for example, for, uh, uh, for C macros that are not uh, basically trivial, so basically a constant or something like that, uh, we need to put them in a, in a C helper that we call uh, like this, like the back macro, for example, in the kernel, and then we call it uh, in a C file. And then that's what we generate the binding to from Rust. So that's what we do for. Uh, but it's not a question for Wokun because Wokun uh, uh, knows about this already, but just in case to clarify. Um, the Rust parser is written in C++, so we will have to translate the token stream somehow between C++ parser and Rust declaring it. Well, yeah. Um, Sorry, Miguel, was there any feedback uh, on the use of unsafe functions versus unsafe blocks? I, I don't uh, know if you were yeah, Redson, maybe so had experience you, with that. Uh, we would really love that it's in the main language, like if it's the default in the language. So if we can do anything that we can help uh, get that, uh, our feedback, I think, would be, yes, we really want that because we want to put all the safety commands, we want to minimize the blocks, and that is required if you, yeah, there is some more churn in some uh, functions, but I think when you are writing an unsafe code, uh, you want to be explicit anyhow, and you should not be writing a lot of unsafe code, and therefore, uh, um, yeah, uh, Josh, that, Josh is saying in the notes that it would be very helpful to have that comment on the upstream issue from the Rust in Linux project. 
proper. I think, uh, okay, I will make sure to make, uh, thank you, George. Uh, I will sure to make, I think we, I, I don't know, there is so many things we commented, perhaps I'm mistaken. I think we commented at some point, but uh, I will make sure to, to review that. Uh, thanks a lot, George. Uh, because if we make that happen, it would be really nice, I think. I, all I, nice. I have a question, Miguel. Um, what are some AVI related issues that you've used that um, you've either run into so far or anticipate running into? I think that's one of the major things uh, is like FFI sounds good on the surface, but you know, no one can quite enumerate everything well, example, that goes into an AVI. Well, we had some, I don't remember right now, but for example, even if it is not AVI, even Bindian can make a mistake. So there has been bugs, for example, in Bindian, uh, which means a wrong AVI. So, uh, and there is things that Bindian does not support. Uh, and we have to make opaque, opaque types and things like that. We have to basically whitelist or blacklist or deny a low list uh, the, the, the types, uh, some of the types in the kernel. So we may face some problems later on if we need to ac actually access those structures from the kernel. Uh, that's one problem. Uh, on the ABI per se, I think uh, it worked. When I try to, we have support, but it's a completely a hack between GCC and, uh, and Rust. So you can actually write now for some configuration, it works to build a GCC kernel and a RAD and the Rust size was LVM. And it works, it boots, it runs the samples, uh, but it's very, very, uh, it's a complete hack. So I don't think we want to support that uh, in the long term. We want to either completely build GCC only kernels or LLVM only kernels. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I don't remember off my head right now, uh, on the top of my head, uh, any, any ABI issue. Uh, but for sure, for example, if we use a randomized uh, GCC plugin uh, configuration in the kernel, uh, I don't think that would work because the binding doesn't know about it. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if we have uh, one more minute or anything. Uh, I think I have seen. Okay, well, let me go to the server. Yeah, I think you have five minutes. Okay. Yes. Uh, let me see the server notes. If I missed something, let, please let me know if I missed uh, anything. Otherwise, uh, I can go back here to the to the top slides. Yeah, there's a comment just raising the issue again about stable inline ASM support. And Josh is saying that's on track to be stabilized. I guess I'm curious personally which form that is, because I think I've seen like two or possibly three different forms of inline ASM. Mm -hmm. uh, the escape hatch I mentioned, uh, going to back to the slides, just to fill the time while there is a new question. The escape hatch is this Rust C bootstrap flag uh, environment variable, sorry, um, that you can use to, to use a stable compiler with unstable features. But again, it is not supported. It is not intended to use by normal projects. And this is just what we do uh, in order to be able to build with a stable compiler. Um, and we need it because of the unstable features I already explained. Which components are required to build? Yeah. Sorry, another question or maybe feedback is I think the Rust project has done a really great job focusing on documentation and handholding and getting people up to speed and you know building a community around that. Um, I think there's been significant feedback on the mailing lists that um, the the prospects of learning a whole new language in the syntax, um, and the grammar, and you know that's before even getting to the borrow checker and and having fun wrestling with that. Um, I think just feedback for the project overall, something that might be worthwhile doing is putting together either a series of documentation or some kind of um, some kind of not meetup but um, like a almost like a training class or training course or some kind of documentation that's writing rust for kernel developers and, mm -hmm. and showing people like I think Wedson's um, drivers are a really great first step into showing things kind of side by side LWN did a really great job of kind of matching the lines up like uh, in, in a way that you can easily kind of see the difference. But I think like having some text documentation saying like, you know, we have things like attribute must check and see, but if you don't use it, blah, 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 versus, you know, if you have this monadic use of returning result everywhere, then you can use match and destructured assignment and the question mark operator everywhere, right? And then that's how you avoid this. Or, you know, we have attribute cleanup in C, but it's nice having a first like RAII as the first class language feature. And here's how you can turn some go to spaghetti into, you know, much more straightforward kind of code. And I think things so, like that would be super helpful for kernel developers. I agree completely. Indeed, for the 
what we did to begin with, we don't have the text uh, so far. What we had already in Cangrejos, which was uh, before the week of LPC, we had like a, a Rust, uh, it was invitation only, but it was uh, like a Rust, uh, sorry, what I call? So we got a, a, a training, so to speak, a bit, a, a bit of training on that. And I think we should expand on that. And we should also um, uh, put some training. We, all, we are going also to have a mentorship uh, series uh, that's why, uh, thank you, Shua, for, I don't know if she's here, but uh, she contacted me to have some mentorship series that, uh, uh, on Rust and how to write Rust, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, like mentorship or helping uh, people getting up to speed is, uh, is something that we will have to do. And especially uh, writing some text. Uh, I have independent in the queue some documentation that is half written and I want to upload it. And for example, more on coding guidelines, more how to write these things, uh, how to write a driver, et cetera, et cetera. And LWN, I also want to point out, LWN has been doing a great job of putting some articles out uh, this week, especially, and last week on Rust, and they are very, very informative if you want to uh, follow along. And this is, it explains also a few things. And uh, I don't have time to read the chat, uh, but very quickly, yeah. Uh, Jose, uh, or Jose, uh, do you plan to rewrite Linux existing Rust? No. Um, it's not a rewrite because we are using the CAPIs, so it's not a rewrite. At least right now, nobody is implementing right now. It's not, nobody is implementing new subsystem Rust, but they are actually using the CAPIs from the Rust abstraction. And with that, uh, thank you everyone really for coming. Sorry that it was so, uh, but I, I really enjoyed the discussion. And thank you, Nick, for having me here because uh, I know that in the beginning it was the only talk we had in LPC, but then we had all the others uh, before, and now it's something that we like. Uh, we are a bit. Uh, repeating a bit, uh, but thank you for having me and, uh, and uh, uh, everyone coming. Uh, thank you. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Miguel. It was very nice. Thanks. Okay, so the next activity is the support for ARM64 in Object Tool. So, Josh, where, you, where are you? Uh, uh, I'm making you presenter oh well actually yeah actually I'm taking presenter back so i can put the the right, the right presentation which is object tool oh will okay there you are hello can is your audio hey. working? Can you? Yes. For working. Okay. So let me make you presenter. Thank you. And yeah, and uh, make presenter. There you are. Thank you. All right. Great. I'll just wait for that to propagate. It takes a while. Okay, there we are. Perfect. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, so uh, I'm Will Deacon. I'm an upstream kernel developer. I co-maintain the ARM64 architecture ports with Kathleen Marinas. And I want to talk about Obstool for ARM64. Um, I'm not an Obstool expert. Um, there are people on this call which are, so hopefully that we have to chime in. Um, but I'm going to talk about what I understand of Tool and give an introduction because some of you probably don't know what Tool is and it's not a typo, it's not obj dump or obj copy, it's, it's another, another thing. So let's get cracking. So yeah, what is Tool? It, it's a host program uh, shipped in the, so it's part of the Linux kernel source tree. It doesn't run in kernel mode, it's a host user space tool and it's run during the kernel build and it basically post processes each object file that's uh, being used to construct the kernel image. Um, it's only currently supported and used by x 64 It's been in the kernel for ages, uh, since February 2016, I think. Uh, and it's it's a general binary linter, so it can check and enforce some invariants that we have on the on the VM Linux binary, <clears throat> well, on these on these object files. But it's also it, it's a patching utility, so it can also do some modifications that I'll, I'll talk about later. And it can help to catch uh, issues potentially in the tool chain. So if the compiler has generated code in a way that we didn't expect, or if it had a bug or if there's some assembly code that's not quite right. Um, you know, normally we'd miss those, and if we're lucky, we get some runtime bugs that we would be able to debug, but actually spotting them early is, is really helpful. It does rely for some of the things that it does 
on uh, being able to reconstruct the control flow by looking at the binary. And that can be sensitive to compiler optimizations, right? Because this is not looking at, um, it doesn't have like the compiler IR, it's just looking at the, the, the binary. Um, so here's a commit uh, which actually disabled global common source expression elimination for, I think they tried to do it for a function, I did it for the whole file, uh, because actually GCSE was, was uh, breaking the control flow in terms of uh, what object called expected. So more on that later, I've got uh, an example of how that happened. So on x86 specifically, what does it do? Um, so sort of three broad classes of things. Um, and please, people who know more about Auditor will interrupt me if I get any of this wrong, because like I say, this isn't my uh, area of expertise. But it does three, three rough things. So it, one, it generates this uh, orc unwinding data, which is a lightweight alternative to dwarf. It's extra information alongside the, the binary sideband information, which can be used for doing unwinding uh, without the need for frame pointers. So uh, it means that you don't have to pay potentially the runtime cost of, of having a frame pointer, but also it means that you've got more robust unwinding because, for example, hand handcrafted assembly code doesn't have to mess around with frame records and stuff like that. So that's, that's really nice. And it also actually, I'll talk a bit more about it in a minute. It offers some additional features for cases where you can't actually unwind using frame pointers. It performs binary validation of stack frames. So if you are using frame pointers, uh, it can check that actually your records look correct. And I think it also checks um, some of the orc uh, annotations as well with things like alternatives but it, it can check those and that's relied upon for live patching so live patching is where we're going to be patching the kernel uh, at runtime and we want to have what well, we need reliable backtracing for that so you know make sure you know the, the function you're patching isn't in someone's core chain for example and other things that it can do it can point out um, if you've got unreachable instructions it can check that you're not using indirect branches uh, which might defeat uh, the spectre mitigations repli on x86 it can check that functions which are not supposed to be instrumented with things like sanitizer calls uh, really aren't instrumented. So it's, it's generally, you know, just checking invariance on that binary. And it can modify the binary, as I mentioned. So some of the things it can do, I've mentioned at the bottom, uh, it can convert sanitizer calls to NOPs, because I think there are some cases where even if you say, I really don't want sanitizer calls emitted in this function, sometimes they can be emitted for various reasons. Um, so they can, it can spot any of those and knock them out. It generates a couple of ELF sections for things like ftrace and static calls, which are sort of kernel specific functions where we, uh, it's easier to generate the ELF sections this way than to try and construct them via basically scripts. Uh, and it can do arch specific branch patching um, for things like insertion of funks and, and trampolines if it's required. Peter, do you want to say something? Um, yeah, so the sanitizer thing was, was um, basically uh, some of from GCC versus not having a function attribute to turn off the sanitizer. Okay, so it's not a bug, it's just they were missing the functionality. Which is arguably a bug, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, but that's the kind of thing that, you know, rather than say we have to now require a new toolchain version, we could continue to support the old toolchain version because Optional could step in and do the job. All right. Um, so why do I care about this? Like I said, I don't know anything about Ultra Tool and I'm an ARM64 guy. Well, I've been unwittingly dragged into it. Um, and here's some examples. So Ben H saying, hey, I'm looking at what needs to do live patching on ARM64. So that's going to require this sort of uh, reliable stack trace. And Julian actually posted an RFC a while back uh, for adding the base support. So there's, there's interest from companies and the community to, to have this working. And why? Well, Mainly, we want the reliable stack tracing for the same reasons as x86, primarily for the live patching and the, and the unwinding. And one thing that I talk, touched on earlier is that it, it, it offers increased unwinding capability over frame pointers in the sense that you can unwind now across asynchronous boundaries, across exceptions, which is not always possible with frame pointers if, for example, you take an exception uh, while you're constructing the frame record. Um, but having said that, so it's sort of similar motivations x86, but some of the constraints don't apply. So we don't have repline, we don't have a static call table. And frame pointers, okay, although they can't do this asynchronous unwinding, uh, by and large, they're sufficient on M64. They're quite cheap. There's not much of an overhead just because we have um, lots of registers. Uh, don't um, you want to have a static call table eventually? I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure that we... I guess I love it. Is static call, or are indirect calls any less expensive than just a direct call? Or? We don't, because we don't have the repline. Uh, right, that's true. We, our, our indirect predictors tend to be um, reasonably reliable. So it, it might still offer some performance, but I think we would need to do that analysis from the start to see if it's really okay. worth it. Um, 
I don't think that, there's no reason why it couldn't be. I think I think, I think Ard was even talking about that he might post. Yeah, Ard has patches on the list to do a, 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 yeah. the really basic form where you just have an indirection. Yeah. But anyway, I'm just saying that we, we don't necessarily require it, so it's not a reason to do obstacle. Um, so what we could do uh, potentially, is sort of like thinking about okay, what do we want? Well, maybe we could just start off. We could just have the linter. So we say okay, we're not going to have any orc initially. We're not going to have any patching. We could just say we're going to have it as a binary linter to make sure that um, uh, you know the, the binary is as we expect, uh, and check check our frame pointer stack records, for example. But I think two things happen if we if we only enable that one is it won't be very long before it finds a problem, and then second, people will then be inclined to. I, I enable the patching mechanisms in Obstool to work around those those issues because it's it's easier to do than trying to fix the tool chain or trying to change lots of code. Um, I would argue uh, that the control flow failures, like the failures to track control flow in Obstool, um, which I'll I've got an example of again, but the FGCSE thing, I would argue that's an Obstool bug, um, and we shouldn't be disabling compiler optimizations for that. But that's actually a pretty challenging thing to fix in Obstool. It's, it's really not designed uh, to have that, that level of analysis of the code. Um, so it's easy for me to say that's so why I put it in red, but I, it feels wrong to turn off compiler optimizations to make this work. And I don't, know, I don't know how well that scales either. So perhaps one way to fix this, and I'm asking how feasible it is, would be could we do some of this stuff in the tool chains instead? Um, potentially Obstool, having a, another program maybe like Obstool, which is part of the tool chain, which takes in not just the object files, but also perhaps the IR from the tool chain, something like that, or even having uh, options to the compiler to help us out with potentially a generation of ORC, for example. Um, I don't know how much appetite there would be from tool chain people for that kind of thing. Sorry, Sega. Hi. Uh, 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 if it's possible to, for the compiler to do asynchronous unbinding, right? We already have an option for it. Can you put so your very, back up very, very quiet. quiet? I can't you're hear very, you. very quiet. I couldn't hear what you said. Sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, GCC already has an option to do asynchronous unbinding. It uses the dwarf frame for, for it. And it's the only way to, to do any unbinding on, on many architectures, actually. Yeah, so I think the, the problem with dwarf, I, I think the kernel did have a dwarf unwinder for a while, and it was just a it's very, very complicated, right? You have to have like an interpreter that runs, and it was just full of um full of bugs. It was very unreliable and it got uh it got reverted, oh. I think, by Linus. Wasn't it <laughs> also huge? Yeah. It was like the uh, orc is so much smaller. Right. Yeah, right. so so the, the dwarf unwinder, it was large, it was buggy, it was unreliable because then the dwarf unwinder would crash, would take the whole down while you were trying to stack trace, it was slow. It was dreadfully slow. Yeah, and also we had to have annotations throughout all the assembly code, and those were often wrong and outdated. Yeah, you need CFI directives all over the place, right? Right. Right. So I think uh, there was a there was a GCC plugin posted as part of the AR sixty four patch set. So I think the thing I would be curious about is actually having some kind of formal specification of like what what needs to be provided by the compiler here like to me i'm always curious i think the gcc plugins are interesting for adding support to released versions of the tool chain that we still want to support um but i think like i would encourage people to take a serious look at is it feasible to implement in the compiler proper in the first place and how can it be generalized for other projects than just the linux kernel so like having a formal specification of what would be needed by the compilers, I think that that would be a good start for compiler vendors to then, you know, sort out and argue it out and come to an agreement on how to provide something that's maybe more generally useful to maybe other projects that might have similar problems as well, kind of thing. Yeah, so so the one thing that, that came up a few times is an, is an informal ABI to do the jump table thing and make the control because on x86 we must get our way around detecting where jump tables are but the arm people can't they just could not find the jump tables uh, just from project files themselves so that's what they needed the uh, gcc plugin for yeah in uh, in general it's completely impossible to uh, reconstruct control flow from a binary correct so so some help there would be very 
very nice. This was the example you gave to me, Peter, I think. I just put it in a slide because it's, it's very simple to explain, right? Where we have two conditions. Um, so if conde, then we said this is just sort of pseudocode. We said 2k equals one, assume it's zero initially. And then later on, we say, hey, if not 2k, do something. And Obstor will consider the path where both the conditions are true. Um, and then it can assert all sorts of things which are not reachable in practice. Um, so that's a simple example of, uh, you know, Obstor doesn't really do any tracking of values, but it doesn't do it at all. Um, it's even simpler right. than jump table. So. I do want to say with this example, this, t this particular example has not actually been a problem in practice because um, OBJ tools mostly just worried about stack layout changes. Those, those tend to only happen in the prologue and the epilogue. So um, going down an impossible path, like what you see here, doesn't, you know, usually doesn't produce any false positives. But like Peter said, the main problem we have is just figuring out, um, you know, jump tables. But everything else has, has been good enough. You know, obviously, OBJ, OBJ tool can't do things, uh, figure out things, exact control flow, but it, it figures out most, you know, all possible vectors of control flow it's been pretty good at doing that it's just uh, the jump tables have been the, the major problem yeah so well, i remember running some of these things but yeah mostly we can work around them but it's it's annoying is this like both compilers we can't figure out the control flow from jump tables um so, so x86 x86 has been really difficult for well, you know, GCC came first, and we put a lot of effort into that, and then it mostly worked for Clang. But you know, even Clang has some issues because there are some undefined, you know, jump table vectors that um, that normally aren't used. But OJ tool is not smart enough to figure that out, right? Yeah, I got to fix those up. I'm still that's on the to do list. <laughs> but I'm curious in the AR64 case, um, like I, I'd be curious to see. A description of the problem that actually has like god bolt links and disassembly from the two compilers and shows like you know this is what the jump table looks like in disassembly and this is why it's ambiguous and why we can't figure it out because right. like to my understanding yeah. so far we've just had a dis like people say oh it's broken or it's hard to figure out kind of thing but i think having actual disassembly would make it much clearer uh kind of the problem yeah. Well, the actual, uh, well, the, the main problem really is uh, uh, it can jump to anywhere in memory. Uh, 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 the, the size of the table, uh, the, of the jump table is not constrained in the way the code is generated. You cannot see if you're jumping somewhere outside of the table. So, so you, could, uh, 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 you, uh, you can at the same time make it work with object tool and make the code safer by doing some sanity checking in the that you're only only jumping to valid switch switch cases i think the high level takeaway here though is that whatever we do for jump table specifically that's fixing one case of fragility due to compiler having the freedom to generate code right um, and what we're really worried about is as compilers generate code in different ways going forward, which they will just because optimization passes change and whatever, this will inevitably become fragile again in a different way. And I think the higher level thing that we're trying to figure out here is how do we deal with that in abstract? Is that at all possible? Can can we have sidestep the issue entirely? Well, well, you will prob we probably have to use the uh, asynchronous unwind info that GCC generates. Uh, but, but then prob uh, you probably want to translate that to some other format yeah, that so doesn't think, have the runtime problems. Yeah, so I think for us, um, all we really need on ARM64 to do unwinding correctly is to know when we need to start from the frame point or, or the link register, because, because uh, the, our procedure call standard AAPCS64 gives us relatively strong guarantees otherwise. So I. The information we need is a lot simpler than what's in those unwind tables. I don't know if there's a good way of extracting that or if that falls into the same um, problem uh, as we're trying to extract things from the code in that the format of it might change or the structure of it might change in a way that we're not expecting. Um, I would um, like to mention that the, the CTF people 
they are right now um, designing extensions of the format of the CTF format for version four. And one of the things they are discussing is uh, is uh, how to include simple unwinding info. Um, and they are targeting x86 and also ar 64 arm 64 I thought it was just supposed to be type info. Now we have dwarf all over again. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully not. <laughs> Well, I will say that one of the benefits of OBJ tools is it treats the object file as a black box. So we, we need to be careful about trusting the dwarf or anything that comes from that. Um, that's one of the one of the main benefits we had from Orc was that it was dwarf independent, and um, you know we kind of independently verified that um, that things look sane. I think that's a good point, right? Because we're the, the reason that we would want this uh, is to get reliable stack tracing for live patching. It, it's not, although it's great for debugging, it's not really debugging that we're talking about here. And if if we enable this and actually we can tune the dwarf somehow and it's not reliable either, I, we haven't really solved the problem. We, we, we just have a whole load of complexity where before we didn't. Right. So could we at least uh, use this unwind info uh, to help object to make sense of the binary? Uh, I mean, even though we don't use it at, uh, at runtime, it could use uh, in places where you actually run into these, uh, these issues where you can't figure out what's going on and maybe use it in just in those places and not use it uh, in the don't ship it, don't use it at runtime, don't do anything else with it. Would that make any difference? Um, yeah, that might that might actually be an interesting approach. Um, you know, for finding the jump tables and the jump table vectors, that that might be something to look at. I think that's probably all I had. Let me just double check. I think the next slide was just. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's all I had. Um, not really sure what the next steps are here. Like, to me, it feels like this stuff should be coming from the tool chain and we shouldn't be having an extra tool. But I don't know. That's I, I'm not an expert on it. So um, I quite did not understand why would you not trust Dorf? I mean, I understand that it's not the ideal form, you know, of the information that you will find useful. But why would you not trust it? So I think there's two aspects to dwarf, right? So there's it's it's the the dwarf information itself is produced, um, as far as I understand, primarily for debugging. So it may not always be right. entirely accurate. Um, we're using it for light patching, and it needs to be 100% accurate, otherwise the machine dies. Um, then the second aspect, which I think is the important point, is the unwinder needs to be in the kernel and run, you know, in kernel mode with privileges at runtime and our experience has shown that running a dwarf unwinder in kernel space is it's not a good idea. It's very unreliable. Uh, the kernel crashed. You know, it tries to do a backtrace because it's crashed, and then the back the unwinder itself crashes, and you get no backtrace. Um, right. Well, that's one of the. I mean, if someone mentioned that CTF is becoming dwarf. Actually, it is not because um, the motivation for adding unwind info to CTF is actually for other big program, which is not the kernel. But we understand that. Um, it's not convenient to have to implement a stack machine, right? Just to, for example, to to evaluate the expressions to find the locations of the, you know, of the stuff, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's and, and, sounds like a common goal. Eh? And another issue with with dwarf is the the annotations required in the assembly. They were invariably wrong, and an object tool uh, figures that out all by itself. We we don't have to annotate our assembly. Well, well, it tries to figure it out, and it cannot always. That's the problem. Only for the jump tables. Well, I guess when you found so far, yes. I I tried writing CTF for whatever it's uh, and in assembly, and I always got it wrong. I could write orc uh, annotations, but I much it's much easier. Which, by the way, is just real quick. I have to jump off here, but real quick, do we actually have a ORC specification somewhere that actually defines everything about ORC, or is it just read the code? 
there's some documentation, but it's not really a specification. So yeah, it's pretty much reading the code. So should we work on getting a specification for work? Make it more formalized? Yeah, I think that'd be a good idea. I think one other question. Yeah, is... I'd, I'd certainly be happy to review that to make sure that it can we work for different architectures. Because I, I don't know if there are any x86 specifics in there, um, but you never know. But that was what I was about to say. The, the question there, is there one orc or is there a per architecture orc? Right. right, it's just, it's only been implemented for x86, so it's not really a standard. Yeah, you always find interesting questions with the second implementation, right? Exactly. That's yeah, why I created when I created F trace. I did it on two architectures at the same time. Okay, so I think we're probably done. Actually, I don't know how much time we had. I've lost track. Um, yeah, I think four minutes. Yeah, there's four minutes, okay. but we could probably start with the next talk if they're ready to go. Okay. If there's no other questions for Will. Thanks very much, Will. Thanks for the discussion, okay. everyone. There is a raised hand. There is a raised hand. Andreas. Yes, yes uh, one quick question. So um, re regarding these comments about the difficulty to reconstruct the control flow without having any dwarf um, debug um, external data about that, um, wouldn't that also cause issues for user space live patching? Or are we facing specific issues here that only apply to kernel live patching? So I'm not like with regards to the proposal of on the current slide of having kernel specific compilation flags, I just wonder whether we may just need compilation flags in general as opposed to something that would be exclusive to the kernel. So I think so in user space, is it is dwarf just used? Because you can do asynchronous unwinding with dwarf as I think. Yeah, dwarf is is uh, pretty common, at least in user space, I feel like. So perhaps I think. In user space, dwarf is probably more appealing than, than using it in the kernel. Because um, you know, if, if it doesn't work out, you don't kill the machine. But isn't it what C++ also uses for its exception uh, handling? It's not just for debug, right? Yeah, on ARM, there's, I, got, I remember right. doing this before. On ARM, there's all sorts of different tables um, for C++. I yeah, think the like exception it. handling frames are different from dwarf proper. Uh, uh, but, uh, what, is, what is normally used with GCC is lib and bind which is GPL plus exceptions, so everyone can use it. Uh, mm -hmm. And it can parse everything, and it just works on every architecture. Right, so the, but there's... For, but for some reason, the kernel re-implemented everything, and obviously not correctly. Uh, well, I, there's also places that use, you know, a different dialect of C++ that'll say F no exceptions, and then they don't, they don't need to link against lib unwind, and then everything is like return code based programming instead of um, throwing exceptions and stuff. Yeah, the control for the kernel is also not traditional. We have exception frames, we have alternatives, we have a whole bunch of weird stuff. Um, mostly in an assembly and then the point says, oh, nothing about that. But if you want to unwind properly, you, you need to know about all that. I think one. I, thing I think one oh, sorry, go ahead, Marnik. <laughs> after you. Uh, I, I was just curious if um, maybe we could follow up afterwards, Mark, if you could um, explain a little bit more about the asynchronous online issue that you mentioned between using the frame pointers versus, I think you said the link register. That That's yeah, something sorry. that was. I actually have slides on that. I'm not sure if we have enough time to go over it now, um, but we can do that in a packed session. Well, it's based. Actually, we do because now there is only one minute more for this activity, but now, but now we have a break of 15 minutes. And I can think of any reason why we could not use the time for discussing yeah, just, about anything. Yeah, yeah sure. Mark, can you, yeah, those slides ready to go? Um, yeah, I mean, if Will can, uh, if someone can make me the presenter, um, I can do that because I've not unfortunately, I've had lo uh, uploaded the slides. I, think I you do. Can upload them somewhere, I think. No, you can uh, you can upload them directly here if you are if you get uh, presenter. I mean, oh, okay. I'll explain it to Mark then if I can do that. Mark Rutland makes presenter. So now you must be presenter. Now you can upload stuff. The blue plus button at the bottom left. Manage presentations. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying. To, uh, my computer is actually acting up quite substantially. One moment. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm, I'm unfortunately trying to do this for a Mac and PowerPoint has crashed, uh, which is always a plus. Um, well, well anyway, one anyway. at least. Yeah, so blue plus button, upload presentation. Uh, Reminding to everyone question. that the break, the theoretical break, uh, ends in 15 minutes. Processing. Um, oh, there it is. So, yeah. So, on ARM64, um, our calling convention is called the AAPCS64, and we've, it's uh, on this um, GitHub page if anyone wants to go into the, the fine details of it. Um, big deal is that uh, function calls are made with. Uh, BL or BLR, which is branch and link, branch and link register. Um, these instructions atomically put the return address into the link register, which is just a general purpose register, also known as X30. Uh, and the return instruction just um, consumes that value, leaves the register as is, and is basically an indirect branch back. So it's the callee's responsibility to actually um, save and restore this onto the stack if necessary. Um, and the compiler decides exactly, uh, sorry, the compiler decides if it's gonna do so at all. So like leaf functions, it might not do it for it. It decides um, when it will do so. So uh, it might have a prefix um, of the function where it doesn't actually bother creating this frame record. It decides where it will create it. So it decides exactly where on the stack it would place the procedure calls and it doesn't say that. Um, and it says, and it decides exactly which instructions it uses to create the, um, frame record. So we don't know, we, we basically can't discover it other, by, other than by following the frame pointer. And we can't identify from a program counter alone whether or not the frame has been created yet. And the PCS says that the LR and FP are defined at function boundaries. So when a function is entered, the LR is the address it should return to and the frame pointer points at a frame record created by its caller. Um, but then within the body of the function, you've got this uh, gap uh, between entering the function and creating a frame record, or potentially not creating a frame record at all. So if you take an uh, exception in the middle of a function, you don't know whether you need to start unwinding from the LR or from the FP. Um, and possibly an example will help. Um, so in this block of code, uh, when we enter the function foo, uh, and the PC is pointing first at this store pair instruction, we need to unwind using the LR. Uh, then as of the next instruction, we still need to unwind using the LR, but as soon as we get to the BL uh, here, um, we've already created the frame record, and so we should start unwinding from the FP rather than the LR. And um, when we go and call this function bar, and that bar returns, uh, the link register will be pointing um, back into foo. So we definitely don't want to use that um, to unwind. We get a little bit further and after we've completed this uh, load pair here, we've actually restored the original um, link register and frame pointer. And so we want to, to unwind using the link register again. Um, and then we do the rest and that just consumes X30. So the big problem is we need to know where we are in the function and whether the LR is actually this function's return address or not. And we simply just don't have that information and because there's so much freedom that the compiler has as to how it pushes all this, uh, we, we can't guess guess via heuristic or anything like that. Does that help, Nick? Yeah, no, I think it's it's really helpful. Um, I'm I'm just like picturing a giant lookup table, <laughs> like the fix up exception table that we have, where we say for each instruction, <laughs> you know should yeah. like which of the two registers should you be looking at I, and i think in theory at least uh, i'm not sure the procedure call standard says whether or not these um, are created atomically um, we currently assume they are um, but i think that's something can, that's something that clang and gcc both ensure at the moment and i, th I think it's kind of understood that that has and, to be the case <laughs> and there's like a recent discussion around one of the 
GCC plugins for the shadow call stack that pointed out that there can even be quite a few instructions, I think, before setting up the, the frame yeah. pointer here. So for example, yeah. with shrink wrapping, you can have this early prefix where you have an early return. Um, or, and in, in fact, you can have like a branch table, a jump table here that jumps to multiple things, each with their own um, stacking and unstacking. And like in the worst cases today, you get this horribly long prefix with our branch target identifier, some stuff for patching, uh, potentially jump tables, and then various bits and pieces here. So it gets very complicated very quickly. Um, just as a um, uh, note, can you send either Jose or I these slides, or we'll try to figure out how to attach them? To I'll, the... I'll attach them uh, momentarily. Uh, cool. To the... um, and then I'm curious, on that very first slide, can you maybe annotate it a little bit and just say, um, like, for each instruction, which register should be looked at kind of thing. Um, um, oh, uh, so for this example? Yes. Um, yeah, I think what you said out loud was incredibly helpful. And for anyone seeing the slides in the future, it would be super helpful to have that annotated. I agree. I'll see about um, adding slides for that then. And I'm curious, so what happens today then during an unwind, like a, a panic um, or an exception or something like? So, so we, um, yeah, so, so for regular unwind, so regular unwinds for a function called boundary, we can always do the right thing. But across an exception boundary today, we always start using the link register. So actually, sorry, we start using the PC and the PT regs, which we know is absolutely the thing we interrupted. Then we use the LR, and then we start unwinding the frame records. So that LR value can be, um, but it, it can be a duplicate of what's in the frame record. It can be something bogus because it can be, for example, uh, from the address of this BL. Yep. Yeah. Um, or it can be, or it could be differently bogus because uh, the foo is perfectly uh, permit, is permitted to use the LR as a scratch register to have a transient link, for example. Um, so we overestimate today, which I understand might be okay for reliable stack trace, but it's also a bit concerning, um, but it's generally confusing. And I'm, I'm sure that's frustrated debugging efforts where a stack trace versus the program counter haven't necessarily lined up in retrospect. Yeah, so I, I think that there's a trivial thing that we can do, which I, I've been meaning to do for the last few weeks, which is to like explicitly um, add an indicator that this may or may not be valid to the uh, printed trace, but it's still not um, ideal. I'd very much like us to be able to unwind this reliably if we could. That's a bit like our gas unwinder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so actually, it's a higher level thing. I'd also like uh, the format of the unwinders to be could become unified across architectures at some point. But I think that's a much bigger story. So the output format of the, the stack trace, stack, stack dump code, whatever it's called. Right. I guess we can uh, head to the actual break now then. Yeah, I suppose just before we do, what, what are the follow-ups here then? So you're going to upload these slides so people can see them for reference. I think there was some talk about trying to write down, a, not quite a spec, but like something about orc that isn't just code. Um, but I'm not sure. Didn't hear a lot of screaming, but I'm not sure we've got much of a conclusion on what, what the next steps are for supporting this. I, I, I think... Um... I think there was an idea to, yeah, there's an idea from ARD to uh, read um, DWARF or the EH to uh, find the jump table information. Right, yep, yep. That sounds like, if, if I upload these slides and talk with Nick, maybe we can uh, get something out on the list that better explains the specific problem I think we're trying to solve here on ARM64 for unwinding, and then maybe we can evaluate what the options are from that. All right, sounds good. I mean, what, what we really want is the next time someone shows up on the list with uh, obstacle patches, it'd be nice to have a response rather than just not review them, which is what seems to have happened at the moment. I agree, yeah.
Okay. Um, do I need to do anything to uh, give up presenter mode? Or... Okay, thank you. So now we have seven more minutes of break. Okay, I see we have the presentation material for the bold talk in Indico already. Thank you, Maxim. This is just kind of a summary of the things that have been happening in the Standards Committee from a concurrency standpoint for the most part. Um, uh, there's a lot going on, and this is just a, a subset, but we have to start somewhere. If I get my focus into this thing and then hit page down, maybe something will happen. These are the topics I'm going to cover, various levels of depth. We'll get as far as we get in the time we have. Uh, if you have questions, please, uh, you know, either turn your video on and yell them out or type them in matrix, which I'm just now opening. Um, okay, so starting with concurrency TS2, technical specification two. Uh, there was a concurrency TS1 that had some updates from C11. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. It's that's in the standard by now. Concurrency TS2 started is in the process actually of starting. Uh, in fact, it's just in June. It now has hazard pointers and RCU in it. These are C++ versions of hazard pointers. This is C++ technical specification. Uh, we expect symmetric fences to show up fairly soon. Uh, and sysmem barrier in the Linux kernel is an example of an asymmetric fence. It's a thing where you can use a compiler barrier and have it be, in effect, promoted to a full fence only when needed. All right, only when an update's happening. Um, if things go normally, these would not make it into the standard until C++ 29, uh, that is eight years from now. Uh, with some luck, uh, we might be able to make uh, 2026, we'll see. The little URLs at the bottom are the working papers that uh, talk about things. I won't point them out unless there's something special, but uh, there you have the hazard pointer RCU uh, working papers that uh, feed in to the technical specification. The technical specification itself will be another paper. I'm just going to talk about RCU. Um, Mag and Michael could tell you about hazard pointers. Uh, there were some adjustments. This is not exactly like in the Linux kernel. For one thing, the Linux kernel is C and C++ is C++. There are some changes. Uh, they wanted everything prefixed by RCU, so it's not synchronized RCU, it's RCU synchronized. There's no such thing as an RCU head structure. Instead, there is a template class called RCU object base, and you inherit from it. So, you know, doing things the C++ way. Uh, one of the things that I pushed back on hard was a non-intrusive, uh, they don't call it call RCU, they call it retire. A hazard pointer also uses the word retire, so it, it uh, is consistent between the two deferred reclamation schemes. Uh, one way to think of the difference, uh, RC was kind of sort of a weak reader writer lock and hazard pointers is kind of sort of a an efficient uh, and a little bit different uh, reference counter. Uh, so the so different uh, in our experience, Megan and my experience, if somebody's heavily using reference counters, they probably like hazard pointers, they're heavily using reader writer locks, they probably like RCU. There is quite a bit of overlap. Uh, so, for example, um, the uh, uh, so for so for example, there's things like like uh, RCUref uh, that kind of is a is a reference count in the Linux kernel uh, because we had RCU to start with. Uh, and Peter is quite right. Uh, uh, what we use in the Linux kernel isn't C as such, and it's certainly not standard C. Uh, I don't know that anybody uses standard C. It's hard to get anything done with it, uh, but a dialect of it. And that's true of every every large project. They're using a dialect of whatever language they say they're using. All right. Uh, so what happens uh, uh, with an unintrusive retire? You don't inherit from RCU object base. Uh, just as with single argument kv 3 RCU in the Linux kernel, you don't have an RCU head in your structure. Instead, you just invoke the function and pass the pointer to it. Uh, and then what happens is there has to be an allocation or this is what makes it safe in the Linux kernel. Or if you do a mild attempted at allocation, um, then uh, and it fails, you just call synchronize RCU and then just free it afterwards. So if allocation fails, you still have a way forward. 
in C++ world, things are a little different. What happens is there's a lot of applications that if you run out of memory, game over, they just abort the application and start it over. So, you know, they don't care. Uh, they, they just take it in the short to go. Uh, and presumably embedded applications using C++ and RCU, if there are any, uh, could do a strategy similar to Linux kernel. Uh, let's see here. We've got uh, lightweight. Uh, that looks it looks like some things there from the previous session that I or either I don't understand the question. Uh, Paolo asks if we can have smart pointers that forbid delete until you synchronize the RCU. Uh, I guess I'd have to see more detail on that. It is certainly possible to have uh, what what people do in some cases. Uh, in other, I haven't seen this in Linux kernel, but what they do is they have kind of a combination of reference count and uh, either hazard pointers or RCU. And what happens is the reference counts just count the in, incoming pointers from the data structure itself. And so what happens is when the count of incoming pointers goes to zero, then you then you do call RCU on the structure and everything it points to. Uh, maybe that answer is not, you know, send me an email or, or we can get the question in more detail so I can understand what you're asking. Uh, and and uh, Peter, I think, said the same thing I did, more or less, close enough anyway. Okay, so um, another difference. Uh, in the Linux kernel, what happens is we have a grace period K thread and we have soft IRQs. And if you configure it that way, we've got uh, RCUO K threads, all of which do RCU work off on the side so that the main user thread that does call RCU doesn't have to do anything, really, aside from call or call RCU. There are uh, embedded applications that use C that aren't going to, don't have a soft IRQ and they aren't going to spend another thread. And so what we had to do very reluctantly in my case was mean, was that retire can invoke old callbacks. Obviously it can't invoke the callbacks that were just posted, but it can do the old ones. Uh, and uh, this is annoying because there are certain deadlocks that can't happen in the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel is perfectly legitimate to hold a lock across call RCU invocation and then acquire that lock in the callback. Uh, that won't be something that is portable in the C standard. I've been arguing we should uh, have a quality of information implementation that allows that without deadlocks and I'm getting a lot of pushback. We'll see how it goes. The main difference though is that they have a resource uh, allocation as uh, initialization uh, style readers uh, and C++ does its locks this way as well. And Paolo, you're quite right. It's, it's a lot like defer RCU. Uh, and what defer RCU did is it had its 4K buffer, it stuffed pointers into, and then when you filled it up, it called synchronized RCU and, and did them all. Uh, okay, fine. <laughs> I'm, you know, at some point uh, you have to give people rope uh, uh, rather than arguing they won't need it forever. Uh, sometime I'll have to ask you what problems you came across with defer RCU. Probably the latency when the synchronized RCU hit you would be my guess. All right. Um, anyway, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, thing is that uh, what happens is that they uh, is that uh, by default you just say, "Hey, here's an RC reader," and it disappears in of scope. However, there are mechanisms to allow you to uh, make the reader stop and start and end uh, as they would if you had an explicit call to RC read lock and RC read unlock. Okay, the deadlock. Yep. Okay, that's my main concern. Uh, okay, I, Peter, I haven't seen the RIA extensions with uh, with GNU. I'll have to take a look. Uh, allocation fails, wouldn't work scenarios like I described yesterday where you have nested read lock and update. Uh, and Wedson, you're absolutely right. Uh, it is, in fact, what the rules change. If you have call RC, uh, excuse me, KV free RC with two arguments, where you're giving it a function to call and you're giving, excuse me, you're giving it a pointer and you're also giving an offset then uh, that works uh, That works fine and you have a RCU struct in the structure and you can call it inside a reader, okay? In contrast, if you're giving only one argument and that's just the pointer, there is no RCU head, then it is illegal to call it. And the alt lockdown will yell at you if you try, it's illegal to call it in an RCU reads our critical section. You can only invoke it with a single argument in a context where it is legal to sleep. And that is not uh, within an RCU reads our critical section. So that's an excellent point and uh, that, is something you have to keep in mind when you're using call when you're using KV free RC with a single argument. Okay, uh, uh, going ahead. Well, let's see here. Oh, um, hmm, okay, I missed a. Uh, in any case, 
Uh, there's going to be a CPPCon uh, presentation on this. Uh, Meg and Michael and I will be talking about the hazard point RCU aspects. Michael Wong will be talking about some of the process and other things uh, at uh, this CPP on the week of October 20th. So cppedia.org, shameless plug if you're interested in more details on this topic. Failing that, we have a uh, lifetime in pointers app, uh, which includes zombie pointers. Uh, and it turns out uh, that uh, there are algorithms that have been known since 1973 that intentionally access pointers to lifetime ended objects, and in some cases actually dereference pointers to a lifetime ended objects under certain special conditions. Um, and uh, the problem is that ever since C was standardized in 89 and C++ a few years later, uh, it is at best implementation specified what happens if you even access a pointer to an object whose lifetime is added, let alone do you reference it. Uh, and I've listed some different ones uh, that talk about that. There's a couple of working papers in the bottom that go into painful detail on all of them. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk a little bit about LIFO push. Uh, that's kind of like Triber stack. Um, Meg and Michael did some software archeology span and uh, uh, he found a reference to LIFO push I'm gonna describe in 1973 in a patent application. The patent wasn't attempting to patent LIFO push. It was just saying this algorithm exists. We don't know who came up with it or when they came up with it. We just know it was at least before 1973. Uh, 1973 happens to be the first year I used a computer. So there you are. Okay, so here's kind of an outline of the algorithm. It's very simple. Uh, if you, you can push a single element or you can pop the entire stack, all right? To push a single element, you allocate and initialize the data fields and you do a repeat until the comp exchange succeeds. You initialize the next pointer to the current top element and you use compare exchange to try to point the top to the new element. And the compare exchange will fail, for example, if uh, somebody else beats you to the push, in which case it fails. Uh, you can, uh, in some cases, make comp exchange update the next pointer for you. Otherwise, you have to load it again. You just keep repeating until that works. So pretty simple comp exchange loop allows you to atomically push a single element concurrently with a bunch of other people doing it. Um, you can pop single elements, but to keep it simple, we just pop the entire stack. Because to do that, it's just a single exchange. Do an atomic exchange, push null in there, get the pointer back, bang, you've got the list and the stack is now empty. Uh, okay, so given this, uh, let's take a look at the pointer uh, lifetime zap issues that this shows up. So we have a list this initial state. The things are labeled red when it's unsafe to touch them because somebody else might be doing things with them at the same time. Okay, so red just means somebody else might be messing with it. Um, and so the initial state, we got, we got a stack that's got A on the top and B underneath it. Uh, the next thing that happens, uh, the line between them is kind of faint here. I apologize for that. Um, but we're going to push C onto the stack. So we initialize, we've allocated C, we've initialized. It's green because nobody can look at it uh, in any way, shape or form. Uh, and its next pointer is initialized to the current value of the top pointer. So it points to A. Okay, well about that time, somebody else comes along and yanks the stack, the whole stack, does a pop all operation. So now C's pointer points to nowhere. It points to the, I mean, if they freed up the, they, they pop the thing, did something with them and freed them all, uh, C's, next pointer points to the free list. And in C parlance, this is an indeterminate pointer. C++ calls it invalid pointers to be different. And in any case, the pointer is to a lifetime ended object. And by the rules of the standard, this pointer is now plutonium. Uh, it is bad to even touch it, let alone do anything else with it. You, you aren't even allowed to load it, store it, or do arithmetic on it, except in very uh, careful ways where you treat it as if it wasn't a pointer, but just if it was just bits. For example, you could cast a pointer to the pointer to a pointer to char and then and then access it, something like that. But you can't access it as a pointer. And clearly at this point it's bad to dereference it. Uh, so here we are. Okay, about that same time, somebody else, uh, we've still got this uh, thing, somebody else pushes an A prime and A prime happens to have the same value, or the same address, excuse me, as A did. So it's the same chunk of memory, but it's a different element. And now uh, that next pointer from C happens to point to something that's type compatible, but it's still a pointer to a lifetime ended object. 
And so we call this a zombie pointer. It's kind of back from the dead. If you're working in assembly language, it'd be just fine. The bits are just great. It points to something that's type compatible. Life is great, but the compiler considers it to be to be evil at this point. Invalid or indeterminate, depending on which language you're in. Okay, so uh, next, um, if we were in assembly language, you could just complete the push like that. Uh, and in fact, we can do that. There's nothing wrong. We're doing a pair exchange not on the next pointer, but on the top pointer. And so we end up with this list now where the bits in the top pointer are just fine, but the top pointer itself is invalid. And uh, uh, this is uh, something that compilers hate. Uh, this algorithm has been around for a long time. It's been around for longer than the, either the C or the C++ standard. Uh, every time they complain about it, I tell them that they really need to deal with existing practice. Uh, they don't like that answer much, but hey, you know, here we are. Um, and uh, the goal is to, to deal with this somehow. This, of course, is one example of undefined behavior, which is uh, the worst case what happens when you mess with a zombie pointer. Uh, there are some interesting, ugly things with undefined pointer behavior. Uh, UB can back propagate. If you do something that's undefined, that can cause your program to do strange things earlier. Uh, the standard allows this. Um, and that makes, uh, if you have a mistake that causes undefined behavior, it makes it kind of difficult to debug, which is something that is, there's some shouting about going on about the committees about, about supporting debugging. Um, now of course, the guys that are heavily into optimization, the guys that, who live to produce optimizations that make spec int go a little bit faster, uh, love undefined behavior because they, they live to to find another nook and cranny of undefined behavior they can exploit to make spec and go a little faster. Uh, I'm going to give you an example that was is similar to one presented by uh, I, uh, an anonymous academic in 2007. Um, and the thing is, is that um, if we had some intervening code that set i to uh, the value 5, then it might so happen that a of five by a, by a, in assembly language was in fact the value i, and that could set i to five if we had undefined behavior. Um, if we allow undefined behavior to back propagate, then that could result in i actually having the value five when we came came time to to uh, uh, dereference it. And so we have a situation where this potential non, not really existent uh, virtual undefined behavior justified itself. Uh, this was pointed out by uh, Chatham House Rules uh, forbid me saying who it was, but somebody pointed this out. Uh, the reaction was uh, volcanic. Uh, they were told, nope, this can't happen, except that when I tried to, uh, I've tried to find something, a standard that says this can't happen. I can't find any formal limitation justifying it, although I'm very much in favor of this being illegal, mind you. I mean, there's no meaningful programs if this could happen. Uh, but uh, people seem to be uh, willing to uh, uh, use examples of this type uh, in the case of memory order relaxed uh, when concurrency is in, in play. All right, so uh, that leads us to memory order relaxed. Uh, and uh, one of the ugly things about C++ memory model is it allows out of thin error values. Uh, the the uh, uh, canonical out of thin air has a, a store to X from Y, and a, then another thread does a store to Y from X. If they're both relaxed, then even if X and Y are initially zero, uh, you could end up with X and Y equaling 42. The basic reason is that neither C nor C++ respect dependencies. I mean, they, they respect some dependencies. There's a limited set they have to respect, but in general, uh, they the standard allows them to break them. Um, the uh, thing is, if you have a random program with memory relaxed, it is uh, it's problematic, uh, and the problems can get quite quite ugly. And there's a working paper talking about that. So uh, one reaction is just don't ever use memory order relaxed. Unfortunately, uh, uh, you have memory barriers, and that uh, messes up your performance in some cases, and therefore people do use relaxed. So instead, my advice is don't randomly generating generate programs using memory order relaxed access. In fact, randomly generating programs is kind of a bad idea to start with, uh, AI and machine learning notwithstanding. Uh, basically, if you want to randomly generate 
concurrent programs using machine learning, it's your job to teach the machine learning what programs are legal, okay? And uh, whether it's a person or a machine, you should restrict yourself to programs using known good patterns of memory order relaxed. And uh, for that reason, uh, Hans Mo and I pr uh, put the paper at the bottom here. Now there's, there's a lot of discussion in Matrix. I haven't quite figured out how to respond to it. Uh, so if somebody has something that uh, I should respond to, it looks like a good discussion, mind you, but uh, uh, I'll let you guys uh, have at it. Uh, volatile load and volatile store. Uh, this is uh, sort of a C++ answer to read once and write once, maybe. Uh, Jeff Bastion and I have been pushing on this a little bit, not much lately. Uh, the uh, people doing optimization generally hate volatile because volatile restricts their ability to optimize. And uh, uh, this, uh, uh, if you, they, they're starting to come around to the idea that Linus pushed a long time ago, which is that if you mark the axis as volatile instead of the variables, that gives you more ability to optimize. Okay, uh, address data dependency ordering has been a thorn in my side for almost two decades now. Uh, there's been a lot of electrons burned on this. Uh, uh, this is kind of the major papers over a period of a very long time. Uh, and uh, uh, and one version, uh, the last version of each rather than all the versions. Uh, there's an implementation, there's been a, a Google Summer of Code prototype in GCC, which uh, was partial. And the next step is to uh, is to go further along this and actually get something that uh, works reasonably. The basic uh, thought for the standard is that you mark the pointers that are carrying address or data dependencies, which isn't really what you want in the Linux kernel. My hope is that we can convince G uh, GCC and Clang LLVM that they should give us a uh, command line argument that says pretend all the pointers were marked in that way so that uh, we don't have to worry about it. Or maybe in the fullness of time, we'll decide that it's a good thing to mark the pointers, who knows. Anyway, uh, uh, can also C11, get a, so, sorry, so can we also get an attribute for variables to mark as being a dependency? So for non-pointers? Uh, that sounds like a good next step. Uh, I don't think it is at all safe to, uh, there's code in, Linux, in the Linux kernel I'm pretty sure is broken. They just take an integer and, and pretend that the compiler isn't, isn't killing them. And then, uh, you know, load it with read once and then expect an array reference to give them ordering, which maybe it will, but good Lord, that's dangerous. There's just too many well, things that can bother you do to, to the integers. I'm sorry. So if we're going to do that, we need to mark those. That's not optional. And we exactly. should do something about that code now. It's not good. That, that um, code is well, it's mostly x86, I think, that does it. But there is something in generic timekeeping. x86 is OK if we do to TSO. But yeah. Well, if it's, x80, code, if, it's, if, it's, if it's x86, why not just use a load acquire? Come on. It's free, right? Yeah. So, but, but the timekeeping code has this in generic code. And there, there a annotation might be nice. Uh, something, because right now, that's playing with fire, again there are a ton of optimizations the compiler can do to integers and you're you're playing with fire there i'm sorry yeah, that's that's just not safe so yes if we're going to have if we're going to have right now i'm pushing just on pointers to get started but once we have some way of marking them then uh then it'd be a good next step to apply to integers but first we uh the point we're at now is we have to get implementations in uh, gcc and llvm and i haven't quite figured out how to make that happen yet but uh, that's something on my list. If somebody has some ideas to make that happen, uh, please don't keep it a secret. Uh, there's been a couple people that have, have at least talked to me about it, uh, but I don't know that there's anything that's gone forward from it. But completely agreed. Uh, the, I'm not saying that carrying dependencies through integers is useless. I'm just saying it's freaking dangerous right now. Yeah, I hear you. So as long as... You, as long as somebody other than me is uh, is uh, verifying that the code generated all versions of all compilers and all architectures is good, I'm okay, but I'm not doing it. Anyway, I bet that it's about time for us to be done. Um, uh, the, case, the main thing is that uh, one of the things we've, one of the problems we have is the concurrency C++, C++ communities have been going, went their own way for several decades. And uh, 
uh, the C++ and C guys did a whole pile of stuff that just was broken for concurrency. And uh, the concurrency people have historically not worried too much about the compiler because, well, if you worried about the compiler, you didn't get your job done. Uh, and it's going to be a long, hard road bringing these two communities together. <laughs> anyway, uh, I don't know if we have time for questions or not. Uh, let me take a quick look at the chat and see if there's something that... Uh, Oh, Miss, there's going to be a resolution of made up undefined behavior. Uh, there are people that are deciding to take this seriously. Uh, I'm uh, the optimization is driven so far into undefined behavior that I'm uh, uh, it's going to be it's going to be a food fight. Uh, doesn't mean we shouldn't have it, but it's going to be a food fight. Uh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> And then there was a question I saw very early on from Wedson that said the strategy to call synchronized RCU if allocation fails for call RCU wouldn't work for scenarios like the ones you described yesterday where you would have a nested read lock and update, would it? Uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, what happens if you're using KV free RCU with a single argument, uh, which is the case where it'll go and uh, and 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 uh, call synchronized RCU if it has to, if memory allocation fails. Uh, you're only allowed to call those from uh, context where you can sleep, and that is not uh, in an RC reset critical section. So uh, in the Linux kernel, we restrict it uh, to make it so that it works reasonably. In C++, they've got the option of restricturing or not, depending on the environment. In a lot of cases, they just say, hey, memory allocation fails, bang, kill the whole application. Okay. Um, all right, so we got uh, uh, three or four minutes left, if I'm not too confused. So, more like like uh, like four, yes, four. Okay, <laughs> yeah, four, three. Okay, uh, so I'm not my timekeeping hasn't completely exploded. Let's see, uh, let's see what we got here. If there's something that uh, C23 might include auto, that should be fun. Uh, uh, C++ code these days uses auto really, really heavily. Auto, some variable equals some whole pile of stuff. What's the type? Who knows? <laughs> well, I mean, like we have pretty good coding standards that say like when the right hand side of an assignment has like a static cast or a dynamic cast or something that already s demonstrates the type very clearly, then it's kind of redundant to have it on the left hand side of the assignment. That's true. Well. That's true. And uh, if the type is uh, and 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 I was being a little bit facetious, but in the C++ world, if you have lambdas with captures and arguments, stuff like that, just figuring out what the type is to type it would be a total pain. So uh, it's not like that C++ had any choice but to make auto work, right? <laughs> yep. Iterator types are another awful thing to try to figure out and type. Yeah. No, it's, uh, uh, I'm not, it, it is useful, uh, but it's... Uh, but, but yeah, so we have uh, so we have a bunch of language people here, or compiler people. Um, so is anybody working on on the dependency stuff in the compilers, and what do they think about getting us this attribute? See Marco in the chat, but we might have more information probably during Will's talk that's coming up. That is where we're covering control dependencies for sure. Um, I want a, one clarification. Um, it, it it can't be an attribute because attributes uh, aren't allowed to change the semantics. Uh, it in uh, C plus plus it could be a, a funny templated class kind of like atomic. Uh, in C it would probably have to be a keyword. You know, underbar underbar carries dependency or something like that. And and this but, is because of funny spec or is this? I mean, the compiler could still do it. Well, us. it's just that attributes, are, if, if you, a compiler is supposed to be able to ignore attributes and still produce a correct program. Yeah, that's, that's not going to happen. That, uh, that's well, and that, that's why we can't use an attribute. We have to use a uh, uh, something else instead, which may be a type modifier or whatever. Sager, sorry, go ahead. No, uh, it's true in the C and C++ standards. It's not true in the GCC implementation. Okay. Uh, so... Little, uh, so in the standard, it has to be a, uh, uh, so what we could do is we could have an attribute in the short term, potentially, and then figure that if we ever uh, browbeat the standard and doing something reasonable in this, uh, in this area, uh, we'll have 
something else that can be switched to or used instead. Is that fair, Sager, or am I missing the point? It's completely correct. It's fine. Okay. Of course, some would argue that the standard will never take dependencies of any sort, and so it'll always be an attribute, but okay, whatever, right? <laughs> I mean, C++ added like must tail, right? Which is like the compiler must optimize this and always in line, like both of those feel like uh, they have very explicit um, commands to the compiler on how optimizations need to occur or not. That's true, but is there, can the co source code, unless it digs its own stack, which is not defined in the standard, can the source code, can the source code tell that it was tail optimized or not? I think the answer is no, and if the answer is no, then it's okay for it to be an attribute because it doesn't change the semantics of the program from the standards viewpoint. You're absolutely right. You could dig through stuff and figure it out. Anyway, I bet Jose has come here to tell me that it's time to switch to Will. So thank you very much for your time and attention, and I hope this moves forward some. But let's let's find out about control dependencies from Will. Okay, thank you. Okay, control dependencies. Will Deacon, right? We'll be presenting this. Oh. Uh oh. Am I still here? Will's here. Sorry. He's having trouble with audio. Oh. Hello? Uh, yeah, I, I had, had to drop off. I had to drop yes. off and rejoin. Go ahead. I, I got dropped off as well. Yeah, I think the connection just reset for everyone. Oh, oh, oh no. Okay, well, let's see. It, okay, it, did, not, it, did, not, it did not drop me off. Oh, okay, so it's, it was only a subset of people, I see. Still scary. Now, the shared notes are not working for me. I get I cannot get slash P slash. <laughs> Uh, control dependencies. Okay, actually, let me make sure that the people have not been like dropped with a little poll. <coughs> Still connected. Yeah, funny that will. <laughs> okay, so people please reply to the poll so we know that you are actually here. Sorry, Will, still for here. the delay. Okay, so 62% of people are replying that they are online. Uh, I guess we, we, we should go on, yeah. Um, okay, so the slides are set. Let me make you presenter again. Where are you? Here you are. Okay. You, sh you should be set up now. You are on mute. You are on mute. Please unmute. Am I better now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, cool. Sorry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Quickly get this done before it all falls over again. So, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's me again. I'm sorry. Uh, so, we're going to talk about um, the never ending saga of you know, duh, 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 control dependencies. I spoke about dependencies last year. Um, 
So we're going to focus specifically on control dependencies. And I'm going to have a quite a lot of material because unfortunately there's tons of introductory stuff that I don't really feel like I can skip over. Um, so let's get on. Okay, so mega thread alert. Um, if you've got a couple of weeks with nothing to do, you can go and read this. Uh, it's started by Peter, who is is on the call, and it uh, that's the background behind this. It kind of petered out. There were lots of different solutions that came up. It kind of just stalled, and I would like to talk about it here to see if there's anything we need to do, or whether we can just leave it, uh, you know, um, as it is and not do anything. But let's see if we can make any sense of it. So to recap, uh, what is a control dependency? So when we're talking about uh, dependencies here, we're talking about them from a memory ordering perspective. So concurrency model perspective, where you have a, a load and then some other access and you want to use a dependency ordering between them to ensure that those two memory accesses are observed in order by, by another CPU. So for a control dependency, uh, the, the normal case where you get order is from a read uh, to a write. So the result of a read is used as an input to a condition guarding a write. So if you look at these three lines of uh, kernel C code at the top right, we, we load from foo, so we dereference this foo pointer. The read once is basically a volatile cast. And if the uh, value is greater than 42, we do a store to bar of one. And this arrow I've drawn in uh, helped me show that there is a control dependency in this case from the read to the write. And this ensures that uh, the write is ordered after the read, because if you let that write go out early and then X was you know, less than 42, you'd be in big trouble because you did a write that was not supposed to happen. And then there's some assembly code that shows what that looks like for AI64. There's a compare and a conditional branch that branches over the store if it's less than equal. Um, in practice, not all of the writes will be annotated like this write once. So later on, if you're thinking about solutions to this, you, you can't rely on this write once being here. Um, in particular, if, if there's no data race on the store component, um, then that's not required. So we wouldn't necessarily have one there. <clears throat> uh, so these control dependencies, they're not used uh, super frequently because they're quite um, hard to reason about and there's a lot of scope for, for getting them wrong. But they are used in some places in FastPass and Linux kernel uh, instead of things like stronger acquire memory barriers. So you might know of acquire from, from C11 and we have acquire in, in the kernel as well, but that provides more ordering, right? That's, that's read to read plus write and it's not point to point, it's a read to everything that's after it. Uh, so we could use an acquire, you could replace all control dependencies with acquires, you get, you'd still be correct. Um, but you potentially pay a, a performance hit for, from doing that kind of thing. So control dependencies can, in theory, be broken by the compiler, and they can, in theory, be broken by the CPU. So let's see what that means. So I got a nice quote from um, Al Capone, which was a uh, nice control dependency you got here. It'd be a shame if anything happened to it. And that really is the, you know, we're really on the edge here of uh, the compiler's trying to break them, the hardware's trying to break them. Um, it's a bit of magic and a bit of good luck, I think, to, to make sure that you get the ordering out the other end. So let's have a look at uh, the mob boss number one, the compiler. So you all know this better than me, uh, but these are some of the things that have been discussed in, on LKML and in the memory barrier stick 60 and in that thread that I, I mentioned at the beginning. So uh, one way that a control dependency might be broken is this top right uh, example here, which is if the condition is optimized away because it, it results, it evaluates to a constant. So if instead of checking against 42, we do a mod with max uh, and check it against zero and do the right ones. If you define max as one, in some header file, then obviously the compiler can see that this is true and get rid of it, and now you don't have order anymore. Um, another example would be uh, if a write occurs regardless of the condition. So this that's what this second example uh, down at the bottom is. Um, so we, we we load foo, check it against 42, and if it's if it's greater than 42, we write one to bar and then call throb. Otherwise, we write one to bar and call twiddle. Uh, so you could hoist this right once above the condition and now it's there's no dependency from the from the read to the right. Then there's also some stuff about uh, whether the exact can, instructions that are used by the compiler um, in the back end could cause problem. More about that later. There's uh, the potential for speculative stores. So can a compiler hoist the store up knowing that it might overwrite it with something later? Um, I think we pass f no allow f ooh, I can't even say it f no allow store data races when building the kernel and I think that's supposed to defend against these kind of things or prevent these kind of things but I I don't know how much of that is good luck uh, and how much of that is intentional um, but the kind of examples I've got here they don't well maybe the first one but even then they don't really feel like real code examples it's, it's hard to point to this concrete piece of code and say look this this has gone wrong before I don't think we have any data for that kind of thing 
But if it does, it'll be uh, pretty subtle and um, undebuggable. It would be nice if we could define what is real code and what's not real code um, so that we could you know, say some examples it doesn't matter and others it does, but that's also very difficult. You end up totally need to define syntactic perhaps versus semantic dependencies. And I don't really know um, how we could do that. And there are more examples like this in Mary Barrett.txt if you want to go and have a look. So what about the CPU? Uh, so in theory, the CPU could, um, so I mean, let me rewind a minute. So the, the CPU is, is implements an architecture, right? So for ARM, which is what I'm most familiar with, you have the ARM architecture and you build a CPU to the architecture. And the architecture sort of is the set of rules which you have to um, obey if you're building um, a piece of hardware. And typically the architecture is constructed to strike a balance, at least for memory ordering, between the needs of programming languages and the desire to optimize your microarchitecture. Um, and they strike a balance between, okay, for example, C11 requires these orderings, but we want these hardware optimizations and they make sure that the architecture is written in such a way that it doesn't break C, but it doesn't, doesn't preclude optimizations. So control dependencies are outside the scope of uh, C11. I didn't see Paul's previous talk, but um, hopefully I haven't contradicted anything. Uh, I think that's all about address dependencies. Um, so it kind of means that if you're using control dependencies, you're in this land where uh, maybe the architecture might change uh, to lean more towards hardware and then, and then catch you out. And things like value prediction, I mean, CPUs will already do lots of branch prediction. If you add value prediction to the mix, um, you could potentially have speculative stores. Uh, you can have you know, the same sort of thing right, occurring regardless of condition. There's a conditional instructions. And retrospective relaxations, you know, moving this boundary between hardware and languages, you could end up with code that used to work now no longer working. So on ARM64, thankfully, we don't have speculative stores, uh, which is really good news. Um, there is a sort of example of um, this write occurs regardless of condition. They've got this thing called pointed dependency. Like Jad was hopefully going to be on this to, to talk about it, but she's got some uh, uh, personal things to deal with, so she could make it today. So I'm talking, this is my understanding of, of how this works. So if you see this example again in the top right, we, we load foo, and then if x is greater than 42, we write one to bar, else we write two to bar. So in this case, we do have control dependency from uh, the read to both of these writes. And in the assembly down here, um, actually those writes are collapsed into a single write instruction, um, but there is, there is a control dependency. And then after that, we have a write uh, to another variable, baz, um, of the value three. But in the way that this has been, so the, the compiler could obviously hoist that, hoist that up. But if you if you prevented it from doing so, for example, using a compiler barrier or something, uh, the CPU, at least on ARM, could uh, still perform this store to baz early. It could actually hoist that. So I've not drawn an arrow uh, from the load to that last store. There is no control dependency there. And the reason is it's emitted, instead of a conditional branch, it's emitted this conditional select instruction, which is like a ternary if. And it uses that to select the value which is stored uh, to bar, and therefore there's no conditional branch. Right? The branching kind of happens, if you like, inside the C cell instruction. Um, so that's one example of a control dependency where you might expect it to be there. Even you, know, you, you convince the compiler not to reorder things, but then the, the CPU um, uh, reorders things. So it's another great quote. Uh, you've got to ask yourself one question is, do I feel lucky about the compiler's instruction selection path? Because if the compiler spits out a Conditional branch, you're good for order in that previous example. If it spits out a conditional select, you don't have the order. So one solution to this in that mega thread, and I think this was, there were multiple iterations on this, on this volatile if uh, macro, um, but I think this is the one that um, seemed to get the most traction at the end. And Peter, please jump in if I get that wrong. I think this was it. Um, so th this was a macro uh, called volatile if, which used instead of if, when you've got a condition which is used as part of a control dependency. And I don't necessarily want to walk through this, but it has, uh, you know, so it checks if the condition evaluated to a constant, because then we know we might have that one of those optimizations I spoke about earlier on. Uh, and it uh, relies on lazy evaluation with this barrier here. And we know that we're going to get a conditional branch out of this. You're not going to get a conditional select instruction. You're not going to get the thing optimized away. Um, it's not clear how robust this is because X, the expression X can still be optimized. Um, we've got this built in constant check, but is that sufficient? I'm not sure. Um, it relies at least on this, this barrier here being opaque. Um, I know that in, I think in the thread, some people pointed out that if you have 
multiple barriers. Uh, there's like a string comparison on the contents, which is just an empty as a volatile, but there's a string comparison on those in, in GCC and they can be optimized away or, or combined. Um, the, the one thing about this is it's not, if, if you wanted to upgrade control dependencies to acquire, which is what I mentioned earlier on, you can't easily do it with this because the, the load part, which heads the dependency, is hidden away uh, in X. It's, it's not made explicit, so it's not straightforward to upgrade this to, to acquire semantics. And there were some suggestions on the thread that we might be able to come up with it. Well, there was actually a, a proposal, I think, from Peter again, um, to dis, uh, disallow an else clause, which, which solves some of the uh, writer code regardless of condition cases. And there's, a, there's also an un unclear impact on code gen um, from using this. It's not clear how it interacts with compiler optimization, for example. Peter? Yeah, so there is a variant of this um, where the volatile if macro uh, uses a, a volatile condition macro and then the condition takes X and that might be more amenable to upgrading to acquire. Right. But it's, it's all a bit of a mess. Yeah. The volatile condition, would that then be passed to the, well, I don't know, I'll, I'll ask you later, <laughs> rather than try to explain it audibly. Okay, uh, next slide. So another solution um, was to do nothing. And this was from, uh, Linus uh, suggested this. He said, well, we could just define volatile if to be the same as if, and we use it as a documentation purpose. Um, because the issues you pointed out, uh, although I pointed out in the thread, which I've sort of summarized here, are all theoretical. Um, we don't have any real problem that we're solving here. You know, everything's working well. This is just voodoo programming. We shouldn't do this. And you know, I can actually uh, understand that viewpoint. Um, but in terms of having a bit more of a long-term view, like, will they remain theoretical forever? And if if suddenly we start seeing breakage, it'd be nice to have a solution in our back pocket, um, which we could then actually try to experiment with, rather than have to, you know, come up with a solution on the fly when we've got systems that are actually failing. And then the nuclear option is to upgrade everything to acquire. Um, I've said this is currently my preference. I think that's my. I think it's my preference if we have to do something, uh, if we decide to solve the problem, because um, I just feel that this is the, the kind of the easy thing to do. Um, barrier instructions exist exactly for this purpose, and if we add the barrier instructions, then the compiler is not going to mess them about, and the CPU is not going to mess them about, and we know we're good. Obviously, this needs further benchmarking on, on recent CPUs. There's some preliminary benchmarking I've, I've uh, seen in the past, at least for some ARM64 CPUs, for uh, relaxed upgrading relaxed accesses to um, acquire indicated that the performance um, was in the noise. But that, that's, that's uh, not, I think if we were going to do this change, we would certainly need a lot more um, benchmarking to see whether it's feasible. And it probably isn't feasible for all architectures either. So maybe it's not a good way. Of yeah, there, there's a whole bunch of the risk architectures that only have sync for acquire, and then exactly. they, they get the heaviest barrier of all. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and we'd have a problem actually, the benchmarking I referred to on M64, I only did it for read once, it didn't do it for the atomics. And we don't have uh, RCPC acquire atomics, so we would pay a bit more of a cost there. So definitely some more numbers, um, this, this might not be, uh, it, although it's definitely correct, it, it might not be performing. So I don't know how much time I've got, but I wanted to one another thing that came out of that thread, which I think is relevant for this audience, but is slightly tangential, is we talked about barrier. And as I mentioned earlier on, so barrier is used uh, as a compiler barrier. And I, the definition of, of it was earlier. It's just an empty as a volatile with a memory clobber. And GCC performs straight comparison on those, those blocks. So if it sees them, a uh, barrier on either side of a conditional, it can it can actually merge them into one. Uh, so there was some desire on the thread, I think, for having a version which is which is not susceptible to that. And there were lots of various hacks. I'm not sure everyone anyone came up with some hacks that would work. It'd probably be better to have something from the compiler, maybe a built-in or something. Uh, and while we're at it, if we're improving barrier, having barrier which allowed us to specify access types either side. So rather than just you know all your memory accesses before must before and everything after needs to be reloaded. Um, being able to specify the four combinations of load, load to store um, will be desirable, um, potentially would help with code gen. It'd be interesting to research that, to implement it and see, see what the impact is. Right, so I, I recall from that thread, at least discussing, I think maybe the right memory barrier, which would permit the reads to be reordered across it. And I think that that's something like looking at 
LLVM's representation of inline assembler, we do already split up whether like we break a, a bare like a, a memory clobber into both a read and a write. So it is easy for us in LLVM and Clang to split that up. I would okay. just like to try to standardize that with GCC developers on like what do you want the clobber to be called? Because absolutely. Or we'll have it as a built-in so that we can uh, well maybe that's that has downsides as well. well but it'd be nice yeah, to it would no, avoid the first problem, right? Hopefully, well uh, Linus made the point that it would be helpful, I think, to have actual assembler in there. And and like if you have a built-in, then it's it's just a barrier and you can't have these semantics on and inline assembly in the same statement. Yeah, that's true. So then we'd need something else to, to address that first problem. But um I mean, they, maybe maybe just doing string comparison on as and volatile is is not worth doing. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I part of me feels like the volatile there is like you didn't want it to get eliminated. I don't know. That that's curious to me. Okay, and I think that's all I had. Um, I don't know how much time I got left. I'm sorry, I kind of lost track. But I wanted uh, to get we, through that. So, so we, we, we have ten minutes more. left, so we okay, should be cool. good. Um, I don't know if Marco is on the call. If Marco. If Marco happens to recall, we, we did discuss this a little bit with Paul off list on trying to figure out, could we provide a built in or, or what we could do here. And for the life of me, I can't remember how that thread was resolved kind of thing, but it's probably worth bringing up some of the points there. Um, if, if Paul or Marco happens to recall them. I think the summary from that was yes it's interesting but then uh, we also have to consider what the major architectures want and i think this is also the decision if this is worth doing dependent on what is say arm 64's preference and i think that's what we'll mention right the preference to upgrade to acquire and if we end up with only a few um, architectures that need this then it's not worth doing so uh, I guess that's a separate question, though. We we had we have two things. We have control dependencies, which is what Will's talking about now, and then there's address data dependencies, which are more in the RC reference thing. Is is that your feeling for them? Is that they should upgrade for acquire for ARM v8, or is that Will I'm talking to, or um, where are you at on that? So we I guess we should ask the risk five guys too. Yeah. So I um, for address dependencies and, and data dependencies. I'm quite comfortable with the CPU side of things, um, but I'm still don't get that warm fuzzy feeling that the, from the, the compiler can't break them, right? Which is what my talk was about last year. So currently in mainline, if you enable LTO, we do upgrade read once to acquire, uh, just just to make sure. Um, so so if we had a compiler solution for address and data dependencies, as, as opposed to control dependencies, uh, mm -hmm. that would be something you'd be interested in and, and would be potentially supportive of, depending on everything, yes. of course. Uh, yes. uh, obviously, assuming it actually pushes to LTO and, and is a complete solution <laughs> instead yes. of somebody yeah, halfway absolutely. doing it tapering absolutely. on the top. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so for, for data and address, I would be um, more than happy with the compiler solution because I kind of, I think the hardware is in the right place there. But the hardware is really pushing the boundaries on control dependencies, and I'm, I'm worried about it. Okay, so does that, that seem reasonable, Marco? As a, way forward or is there something about uh, address and data dependencies that's harder in uh, the compilers you work with? I think we didn't, uh, yeah, I mean, for, for data and um, address dependencies, I think it was, that wasn't exactly discussed. We discussed the control dependencies and for that we, we said, okay, if, yeah, if, if in the architecture we decide to upgrade to acquires, then doing this in the compiler may not be worth it. And we end up with something in the compiler that's not even going to be used. Yeah, um, no, I agree with you I completely on that. We didn't, we didn't much discuss um, data and address dependencies. I do have to, okay. I want to mention that um, I got some folks from a, a university interested in this and um, they, they're working on a pass, compiler pass to essentially check if certain dependencies were broken or not. I'm not sure how far they've gotten so far. I don't want to make any promises, of course, but I think one thing that I've been wanting for a while is a way to essentially measure what is actually broken. And I hope that their work will provide something like that. And I think they, they do want to provide this for both the um, address dependencies and control dependencies. 
Well, so far I haven't um, seen any results yet, unfortunately. That'd be really cool. Uh, I mean, yeah, I understand that it's uh, uncertain uh, as always, but it, that that sounds like an excellent uh, piece of information for us. Yeah, yeah I, and I, I think with any luck, you, you'd end up either, either you get lucky and it says actually we're not breaking this and that's good news, or you get a whole load of new examples, which might be somewhat more realistic than the, the ones I have in here. So that would be fantastic. If you, if you want control dependencies defined in, in the compiler, then you need to define what the control dependency is, describe its effects, uh, not on the machine code, but on the actual semantics of the program. Because uh, you cannot say what the machine code is uh, is uh, is supposed to be like. Uh, the only way, well, you you can you can write assembler code, but but that's the only way. Yeah, it, it, uh, agreed, and that's uh, that's much more difficult, in my opinion, for control dependencies than it is for uh, address and data yes. dependencies. Yes, very much so. Yes. Although I freely confess that my first attempt to define it for address and data dependencies in the standard was a uh, was not a success. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, on the flip side, the uh, so I understand what you're saying. Um, on the flip side, like. A macro to force a conditional branch instruction. Um, I know that's not defined in any language terms whatsoever, but having that as a built in uh, does allow um, a significantly better implementation than us having to. Yeah, bodge the macro does not force a conditional branch instruction. That's just what you, what you see happening on all your, all your test codes on all architectures you try to run. It doesn't actually force force uh, conditional branch. So if if conditional branch is what you actually depend on, then you really need some way to really generate a conditional branch. Yeah. Can we go, to, can we go to the slide uh, that we're talking about just to make sure? Because I'm oh, not yeah, sure I've, was, I'm putting it with the uh, right thing with the right thing here. Yeah. Here we are. This guy. Is that so is that is that the right one, Sager? Uh, uh, the, uh, the correct example, you mean? Sure. Yes. Is that the correct example? Well, yes, it's one example that's, yeah, that's not, not uh, that does not force a conditional branch. Yeah. Right. I guess the question is, is it possible to rewrite a macro like this using inline ASM that explicitly has a C cell instruction? Or, sorry, is the point to avoid the C cells? We don't, yeah, we don't want the C cells for this. We want, we want a conditional branch. And to yeah. be honest with you, I don't see how this could be compiled in any other way, but I, I agree that that's not enforced by construction. Well, well, there could be other code around it, right? That helps uh, op op optimize things. So part of the condition goes away and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Sager, suppose uh, that the condition had a, uh, was based on a volatile load. In that case, we know the load can't go away. So uh, to avoid the branch, or well, I'm going to ignore C cell for a little bit. That's obviously important, but I but I'm going to take one step at a time. If we have the volatile load, um, uh, it seems like that should prevent. Uh, combining with previous conditions, or is there some trick I'm missing here? I'm, I'm sure there's some trick I'm missing, but let me know what it is. Well, if you have a, a, a volatile load and the if is actually uh, based on result of the load, right? Then that cannot be optimized away, I guess, right? Okay, so if we if we make sure the condition depends on a volatile load, then this would. Uh, make a branch, or, or am I being optimistic in my interpretation of what you said? Uh, well, it would generate some code that has the same effect as a conditional branch. So it uh, might, for example, so generate it, a C cell instead if it could. Exactly, it could still be a C cell. And I think, when, from what I saw on Will's slide, is a C cell. Well, uh, at that point, we get into having to look at what else was going on. But I think Will said that uh, C cell. Itself respected the control dependency. That's that's correct. Yeah, and and then turned it. Yeah, okay. Uh, 
I'm not sure what that means. He still respects the control dependency. So it means it means if the if the value being stored is the output of a C cell instruction and the condition of that C cell instruction is determined on the result of a, a load, then the load to the store uh, are ordered. Okay, sure. How many minutes was that? Was that one? Oh, it doesn't matter. I think it was one. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, yes. Okay. All right, okay. So it sounds like there's not much of an appetite to say that this works, but there's also not much of an appetite to uh, support this in the tool chain either. So I'm not really sure where it leads us. I suppose right, right behind the eight <laughs> ball as always. Sorry, Paul. Right behind the eight ball as always. <laughs> yes. Um, I suppose for now we'll we'll do nothing then. But um, I don't know. I have a, I have a nasty feeling this will come back and, and bite us in the ass as it is uh, at some point. So maybe I'll be back next year with um, some more dependency talks. So so okay. maybe I'll have to to dig into the thread eventually, but. Uh, uh, we discussed ASM go to on the chat. Uh, so, so I mean that would be a proper way to enforce to force uh, instruction selector uh, selection to choose a, an actual uh, conditional branch. But I, I I'm not aware of uh, what people uh, what Linus don't like about this kind of uh, uh, way of doing things. So I think that was actually the initial implementation that Peter posted in that big thread. So actually, if you if you do click the link for the big thread, the, the first thing you see should be uh, exactly what you described. Um, yeah, we based on Linus had an opinion. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Probably about email nine ninety five or something in the thread. But uh, I tried to find out where it concluded for this slide deck, so I didn't um, just waste people's time on something that was was um, discounted. Cool. Well, I better stop. Um, thanks again. And uh, I'm not sure who's next, but I'll um, I'll get rid of myself. Thanks. Now we have a break of uh, 15 minutes. Actually, I have a question. Because, okay, we have the notes that Nick uh, is taking in the shares notes, but is anyone is gonna actually make sure that all the discussions and proposals for new buildings, new attributes, and so on in the tool chains are going to actually be submitted and discussed upstream, like in the GCC list and also in the LLVM list. Maybe the tool chains mailing list in the kernel is the right place for doing that? I don't know. Yeah, I think that's a good start. So we can maybe send the notes, the shared notes there. I just subscribed, by the way. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it, pretty much we want to make sure that before either of us sign off completely for the day that we copy and paste the, uh, the, the notes so we don't lose them. Oh, yeah, and please, nobody should click on the end meeting. Uh, so we, yeah. we subscribe to this list by going to kernel.org and looking for tool chains or something? Could, mm, could someone, someone paste the, the link. Uh, yeah, let me find chat. it. I have it in the notes. Um, I just got to scroll down and find it, and I'll put it in the chat again real quick. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Maxim uh, Panchenka. I work at Facebook. And today, I would like to talk about optimizing Linux kernel with Bolt. And Bolt is uh, a binary optimizer that we developed at Facebook. So it's uh, an open source project. We're also trying to uh, include it in LLVM Bono repo since it's uh, using the LLVM libraries and it, it can facilitate building more tools on top of LLVM. Um, please uh, interrupt me anytime during the presentation because it's more, I want it to be uh, more of a discussion than a presentation. And the proper name for this slide should be more about challenges of optimizing Linux kernel with Bolt, because uh, as of right now, we are not optimizing uh, Linux kernel or with Bolt, and um, I'll explain why. I don't have uh, all the answers right now. I don't even think I have uh, all the, the proper questions um, to make uh, Linux kernel fully optimized uh, with Bolt. But uh, let's uh, let's start with. Um, the slides and uh, I'd, I'd like to briefly describe what Bolt is. Uh, 
uh, how it works, which will be relevant to why we have challenges with uh, the Linux kernel. Vault stands for binary optimization and layout tool. Um, it works on pre-compiled uh, binaries. Uh, it's a, uh, takes binary as an input and also applies a profile to it. It uh, constructs uh, control flow graph internally and real this code, which is uh, its main optimization. But the set of optimization is not limited to just code reordering. Uh, why we want to do it, it's because it brings us uh, a lot of performance wins on top of uh, uh, PGO and LTO for large applications. Large applications mainly means something that suffers from a lot of uh, uh, for CPU front-end stalls. Uh, iCache misses, ITLB misses, and branch mispredictions. From the very, very high level um, perspective, Bolt does a code defragmentation. So if we look uh, at some binary image uh, in memory mapped to, to this space, um, typically the code will be laid, laid out in the order that was written by developers, which is far from optimal from uh, execution perspective. Then with optimizations applied, uh, with compile optimizations at link time, and perhaps with a linker script, we can get a much better uh, layout. But to achieve the best one, we actually have to, to use post link optimizers such as Bolt. Defragmentation is not the, the main optimization. The, the actual code layout is driven by um, an algorithm developed also at Facebook which uh, improves uh, the application performance uh, slightly more on top of like uh, very um, coarse screen um, defragmentation. The results, uh, I'll show you some results. Uh, this, this actually achieved on compilers themselves. So it turned out that uh, compilers such as Clank and GCC, uh, they suffer from a lot of uh, problems I described uh, in uh, CPU front-end. So they can, the performance of the compilers can be improved drastically with Bolt. And uh, here uh, you can see some numbers gathered on, well, it's not the, the latest CPUs, but uh, you can see that Bolt can speed up the compiler, uh, for example, building uh, some project by uh, almost 30%. Uh, the same can be achieved with PGO uh, and L2 optimizations. Uh, or almost the same, but to, to get the, the maximum benefit, it's actually um, best to apply both optimizations. Well, actually, PGO, LTO, and Bolt. This is how you get the, the, the maximum uh, acceleration of the application. Bolt currently runs on um, x86, and uh, some support is added for AR64. Uh, we target ELF binaries, but also uh, there's a very, very uh, uh, draft support for uh, macro binaries. Mm, to use, you don't have to rebuild your application, although we recommend relinking it with a special flag that will add uh, metadata to the binary. Uh, it's a dash dash and it relocks flag. Uh, the code will be exactly the same, it just uh, adds some information in, into the binary that makes uh, it easier to, to optimize and change layout and relocate code. When you get a profile, you can use uh, Linux perf tool or any other sampling based tool uh, that can be converted to Bolt, in, uh, the output should be converted to Bolt internal format. And we prefer to, to use LBRs, last branch records on Intel CPUs. It's, uh, it gives us the history of execution, you know, like a, a tracelet of what happened uh, without any overhead. So we can do profiling in production and take uh, a binary from production and optimize it and make it faster. Yeah, LBRs, uh, I think the AMD has some support for it. Uh, I know some ARM vendors also uh, has similar features. So it's not uh, super rare, uh, but if, for example, you're running your application in the cloud, you don't have access to LBR, 
for, for these scenarios, we provide instrumentation. You can actually use all to instrument the binary, run it with a slowdown, of course. Um, that's uh, the downside. Uh, but then you get the profile and you can optimize your binary. The, the question is like, can you do the same sort of optimization in the compiler? And um, it's not as simple to, to answer. Uh, with, the, with a single profile pass, you generally cannot. With two profile passes, it's, it, I, I guess it's possible. It's more cumbersome solution, but uh, I, I think it's possible. Um, and so if, I, if I'm not mistaken, Features like that were implemented in LVM, but uh, they're not, I'm not sure if, how many people use those. Uh, also with Bolt, you have exposure to more code that just coming from the compiler. It could be third party libraries, it could be assembly code. So you have uh, ability to reorder any code on the input. Internally, uh, that's a slide that describes how on the high level Bolt works internally. It, uh, it looks in the binary, it uh, discovers functions in it because that's uh, the, the highest, well, we, we consider that the, the program consists of uh, functions and uh, that's a pretty, pretty valid assumption. I mean, it doesn't have to, but typically that's uh, what uh, the regular application will be uh, looking like. And so uh, on, on the ELF uh, function boundaries, they are well-defined and they, they are part of um, x86-64 or MB-64 specification. Uh, if you look at each frame, uh, they will give you the, the boundaries for, uh, for, for the entries. And uh, one of optimizations that we do, for example, we break function boundaries, we split functions into uh, pieces. So uh, for that reason, we have to update uh, each frame uh, sections as well as uh, some other metadata on top of later. Once we uh, discover functions, we disassemble code, uh, we, we construct CFG. You know that in, in general case, it's not possible. It's a, it's a hardware program. Um, when we talked about OBJ2, uh, we mentioned that sometimes uh, code from the compiler for for jump tables, it uh, breaks the assumptions. So, so this can happen. And um, it's important to uh, realize that for optimizing the code, uh, we don't need to know 100% uh, or for all control flow graphs in all uh, functions. So if we decide that uh, CFG is not buildable for some function, we can actually skip optimization of it. And that's uh, the kind of luxury that we have um, when we optimize code as opposed to OBJ2. So OBJ2 has to be like 100% correct, right? Um, uh, but for us, we can uh, decide that we can give up on some functions and we only, let's say, optimize 98, 99% of all functions. But for performance perspective, it's, uh, it's not as uh, important. Like uh, if you don't optimize uh, one or 2% uh, of functions, uh, you still achieve most of the performance benefits. Um, is it a decompiler? I think decompiler is supposed to, to raise the, uh, the code from binary level to a much higher uh, internal representation or maybe even the source code, which uh, Bolt, right now is not doing uh, because uh, it doesn't have to, uh, it only uh, does code layout optimization. So our internal presentation is uh, it's kind of very simple. It's uh, built on, on top of uh, MC layer in um, uh, LLVM, uh, but it, it extends it. It builds functions, it builds basic blocks, uh, but all with MC instructions. So um, that's, uh, that's how, uh, how it operates. And of course it applies profile, it reads uh, debug information, but we only use debug information to update it. We don't rely on debug information for any uh, optimization decisions or even control flow or graph building decisions because uh, WORF uh, is not meant to provide like uh, to, to be 100% correct. And I think uh, 
when uh, OPS2 was written and DORC was introduced, um, people had this, this very, very similar concerns. Uh, I'm trying to read uh, comments uh, on the chat that uh, also feel free to, to speak. Uh, yeah, well grind internally, I think, yeah, it's, it's very similar. But again, for, for well grind, it's, uh, uh, they have to fall back to interpretation uh, when they don't uh, understand some code. Uh, we, we don't have to do this. We can just, uh, like some function with a very vague control flow, we, we can just skip over it. And uh, if we, if for example, we could you use Ball to build tools similar to Valgrind uh, to do instrumentation, I think you can. Uh, like for example, to build a, a memory sanitizer uh, or to assist memory sanitizer, that's also possible. Because uh, right now, uh, say sanitize the, the exposure they have is only to uh, the compiler generated code. Assembly code is uh, left uncovered and this is where Vault can help. So it can um, introduce instrumentation to uh, assembly written code to, to assist sanitizers. Uh, well, after we do our optimizations, after we reel the basic blocks, that's one of the main optimizations uh, um, in, in our um, um, tool, we emit the code using MC layer and we rewrite the binary. Um, we, we can do it in place, meaning um, this is something that I'm actually considering at least to begin with in Linux kernel when we don't move functions, we only build the basic blocks within existing function boundaries. Uh, of course, it has some uh, limitations, including performance limitations, uh, but it's the easiest way uh, to start optimizing the binary. Of course, the, the full optimizations involved uh, complete reshuffling of the code, the one that I, I showed on the on the heat maps. But uh, it's it's a lot more difficult to achieve, uh, especially uh, for for the binary with a lot of metadata uh, that needs to be updated. Um, okay. So, we, which brings uh, me to the topic of uh, actually challenges uh, uh, rewriting and optimizing the Linux kernel. Of course, the focus here is on optimization, but um, maybe the scope shouldn't be limited to just optimization. Um, and uh, if, you, if you have any ideas related to instrumenting Linux code or adding some security mechanisms, uh, that's, that's definitely something uh, we, can, we can think of adding to Vault. Uh, for one thing, Bolt uh, is able to introduce uh, red links in, in, into the code. Uh, for example, if they fulfill binaries that were not hardened, uh, we were able to, to inject a red link code in them. Um, um, so some questions from the chat here. Um, so another Nick in the chat is asking, I wonder what the optimization passes are. Your audio was a little blurred. Um, can you oh. cover what you meant by movement? Uh, something about basic blocks, per, perhaps movement of basic blocks? Oh, okay. Uh, I hope, uh, yeah, let me move close to the microphone so you can hear me better. Right, so the main optimization is the code layout. Uh, we, we start with moving functions, uh, moving basic blocks within functions. And uh, it's driven by the profile. So you can imagine that uh, the most executed basic blocks are grouped together. Um, that's the very simplistic view, but it's, um, that's, how, that's how it goes. And blocks that are never executed, called basic blocks, they move to, to the end of the function. But then we can also split the function, take all uh, called basic blocks and move them into a separate uh, block of code that may move far away um, into what we call called text. Uh, and of course, then we reshuffle uh, the, the hot parts of the functions, uh, we group them together. And there's, a, there's another algorithm um, that, that we use for that called hfsort. Uh, I hope this uh, clarifies what I mean by basic block optimizations. And I hope my audio was better this time. Uh, so I guess the, the main question that I have, um, or the, the concern that I think is probably difficult for um, for using Bolt on the kernel is that uh, like while 
the kernel image is packaged in an elf ex like an uh, an elf you know executable file container um, we do use a bunch of non standard or custom sections that have semantic meaning like just for the kernel for instance like there's a, a whole bunch that don't you you probably would never really see in in user space and a exactly. lot of them have yeah exactly oh perfect yep okay so like x table or fix up i think were kind of the two that i was most curious about where um if i remember correctly and someone correct me on the kernel side if i'm wrong here is whenever we're given a pointer from user space um there's an ambiguity where user space could be either giving us an invalid pointer or a pointer referencing memory that's not paged in yet and so dereferencing that pointer can cause an exception um, and we can either try to recover from that when it's a valid pointer by paging in memory and then returning control flow back to where we came from. And we use asm go to for that in the kernel where the inline asm actually will end in a label where the label will now point to the next statement in C code. And I believe because of ASLR, we have to build the kernel as position independent code. And I think we may leave behind a relocation in one of those tables i could be wrong but i think that's something where if you're shuffling around the actual instructions in a function and mm -hmm. that that table gets out of sync where with the new location of the instruction that could fault then we're not going to be able to recover from an exception and that's like an immediate kind of panic kind of thing in the mm -hmm. kernel like I, i'd expect that to prevent us from being able to boot very very quickly kind of thing yeah, I, I think, it, it, yeah, you're completely right. There are so many um, extensions, I would say, to uh, that affect control flow and control flow metadata that kernel uses that it's uh, kind of, uh, I, I think we know some of them and I provided like a very uh, incomplete list here, but uh, there's, a, there's a lot more. Um, there's, uh, like uh, unwinding information uh, for, for exceptions, uh, that there are bug tables that, that we need to update. I would say for uh, C++ code, right? For, for user level C++ code, we already update uh, each frame. We, we update uh, C++ exception tables. We update WORF, but that's for user space. For, for kernel space, it's a, it's a lot more sections. And I think it's possible that in the future there will be even more, right? Uh, I think there are, well, they are not in the future, there are, right now there are some um, SMP uh, locations. So definitely something we have to be very careful, especially uh, considering that one of the optimizations we do, we remove um, knobs from the code. And of course, knobs uh, are used uh, typically just the space reservations in, in the kernel, right? And the kernel patches itself, actually patches itself uh, at the, the boot time and it also at, at runtime. So uh, it's uh, it's a lot, uh, a lot of metadata to, uh, to take care uh, of. Um, so uh, how, how are we going to do this? I, I think uh, the, the current approach, well, uh, we will s start with a very, very gradual um, We'll take a gradual approach by looking at the functions that are easier to, to optimize, the functions that maybe don't have all these uh, uh, tables and uh, see where it takes us. But over time, we definitely would like to get uh, more and more features. And uh, finally, we'll be able to rewrite, let's say, 90% of the code uh, in kernel, which you will be super happy uh, about. And I think right, I suspect be, at, at the very least, benefits. Bolt that Bolt will either need like a kernel mode or special rules and handling for certain things you probably will never see in, in user space applications. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna have to do the org tables and, and probably the F trace yeah. tables. Otherwise mm -hmm. there isn't a single byte of kernel code that you can move around. Exactly, yeah, yeah. I think org tables are the must. Uh, some features I think we can, I don't know if it's possible to, to disable left trace just for performance evaluation, uh, but that's also another approach like can we disable features just to uh, to get performance numbers and see if it's worth like. Uh, yeah, F trace is optional. Some things like mm -hmm. static call, I don't think is optional anymore in x86. 
Um, no, static hole, the jump label side, uh, the alternatives, all that stuff is non-optional. The paravert stuff. Yep. Yeah, uh, well, paravert stuff. I think it's yeah important uh, definitely for uh, for some scenarios, but. Uh, we will start, let's say, without supporting power virtualization, and uh, over time, I think that this this could be added. Um, but these are, yeah, things. That, so, these are re really good points. Uh, some other some, questions. Someone asked. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, yeah, I think there. Yeah, there are a lot of questions. Uh, I'll, I'll try to to catch up. Uh, the latest one was: uh, Is debugging for altered? Yeah, we are, we are, we rewrite uh, dwarf. Um, that's our uh, debug information format. Uh, we currently support Dwarf uh, version 4, and we add in support for V5. We also support Split Dwarf. Um, F-Trace, well, uh, at some point, yeah, that's, that's the plan. We'll have, to, uh, we'll have to understand the uh, metadata, F-Trace data is encoded and uh, updated. Um, and then there was an earlier question about, um, can you speak to some of the differences um, that Bolt does above and beyond PGO. Um, it feels like there maybe mm -hmm. some of these can be implemented in terms of PGO, or what's the major, like some of the things that Bolt can do on on top of PGO. Yeah, I think I, I covered it in one of the earliest slides. If you look at the performance numbers, we definitely improve on top of PGO, so that's uh, the reason we want to do it. Uh, in addition to PGO and LTO. Um, but but could you have fixed PGO? Yeah. Can we fix PGO? Uh, it's interesting. So with PGO, uh, you collect information at a very high level, and then you do optimizations, including inlining. And you have code after inlining, and uh, very often you don't have the context. You don't uh, understand how the function after being inlined behaves in this context. What can help is the context-sensitive profiling, which is being currently added into LLVM. Uh, and this definitely helps, but there's still uh, uh, the concern about the quality of profile. It's still not as perfect for layout, code layout purposes. So there's, uh, there's always more performance to be gained on top of that. There is another question about uh, Sun Studio compiler did this too. And this is from Diane Mayrowitz. Uh, well, hi, Diane. Uh, I actually used to work at, at Sun um, from 2000 to 2007, uh, where I worked on the yeah the post length optimizer, uh, which uh, which was a feature of uh, the, the the Sun Studio compilers. But uh, I'm not sure how how it was used outside of the company. It's uh, I think it was used to optimize the Oracle database. Yeah, these are uh, like static call sites, jump label sites, uh, fix up alternatives. Yeah, all, all these actions, it's all uh, metadata that we have at least detect, at least recognize if the function is covered by some of this metadata. And uh, if it is, we can, uh, if it's minority functions, we can skip, skip them. If not, um, we'll have to. Eventually, the plan I, is to actually update all of this metadata. I, I feel like um, the best reference is pretty outdated at this point, but LWN did have an article covering what a bunch of the non-standard sections were that are in use by the kernel. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I think it both needs a refresh because um, I do think it's quite out of date at this point, and it probably needs to go in the kernel tree under documentation and actively be maintained kind of thing because, mm -hmm. you know, anyone looking at the output of readelf dash capital S is going to be like, what is going on here? What is all this kind of thing? Um, yeah, yeah, oh, okay. totally. Um, Bolt is the only thing that I know which uses DW for indirect. Uh, this is yeah, this is for updating dwarf. Uh, uh, we use uh, sometimes non. Well, they are part of the standard, but. Probably no uh, dwarf producer uh, uses its features. This allows us to uh, quickly update dwarf without uh, having to rewrite uh, whole sections. Uh, 
another challenge is actually to uh, where once we produce new code, once we produce new metadata, like where do we uh, place it? Uh, for for regular elf binaries, we can introduce the new segment or even segments, and uh, it's uh, it's not a problem for for the code uh, we worked with so far. Not so simple with uh, with the Linux kernel. Uh, I don't know if it's even possible to add new new segments. How the the loader will um, react to it. And one of the ideas is uh, we, we actually uh, pre-allocate some of uh, uh, the space during link time. So in the in the link script, we can introduce new new sections and use them during. Um, right. If you don't use an existing section, if you don't use an existing section, then the loader may not map um, whatever code or data into memory. So this is like a really common issue we hit with um, orphan mm -hmm. section placement in the linkers. Mm -hmm. Is like if it's not specified via linker script, it tends not to get mapped into memory, and then code and data mysteriously goes uh, unmapped at runtime. Mm -hmm. like the kernel will just take anything that's in load and put it in memory. So if it doesn't end up in a load segment, it'll ignore it. Okay. Yeah, I think we can ex definitely extend uh, or add new segments. But uh, what we, I think, another uh, concern is what symbols do we have to update uh, the, the kernel symbols? For example, the kernel will have to do a heap allocation, right? And it has to to know to do it uh, after the the last allocated uh, segment. So yeah, that's uh, extra information that, that we'll have to, to update there. Question from the chat. Does Bolt inlining maintain symbol interposition in user code? Would this be an issue for loadable modules or BPF? Um, at least for the kernel, I don't think we're using symbol interposition, but probably a user space centric kind of question. Well, well we support inlining, but it's uh, it's not something we regularly do. Uh, we rely mostly on the compiler to do inlining, uh, because the main benefit of inlining optimization is actually uh, that it uh, provides more context for the whole uh, compiler optimization pipeline. So if you do like really late inlining, it's mostly beneficial for small functions uh, where the major uh, benefit is from eliminating the call uh, overhead. So that's uh, the, the only kind of inlining Bolt really is meant to do. And uh, originally I don't plan to enable inlining and uh, I'm not sure what, what is meant by symbol interposition in, in the user code. Uh, it's, it's like it, LD preload. Like you, LD, okay, for LD, yeah, I was yeah wondering if it's a LD preload. I mean, of course, we, we will break this uh, if if you if you do inlining for for functions that you want to interpose on uh, like it's, it's not gonna work but yeah we you don't have to if if you plan to use interposition like don't, don't use inlining in bold and then maybe in the last minute there uh, is there any issue you foresee for BPF or loadable modules I don't think loadable modules can do interposition but I might be wrong there. Mm. Yeah, I honestly I don't know uh, like uh, if that would be a problem, but uh, okay, I the answer is that it cannot be done. I mean, again, I wasn't asking about interposition. Does the bolt transformations provide mm -hmm. create any issues for BPF? The way that it's changing symbols, moving them around, does this have any impact? Um, well, that's, uh, yeah, the kind of questions I, I don't have an answer to, um, and, uh, I would like to know, like, will, will it be, um, if we, if we properly update the symbol table, uh, will it, will it be a problem? I, I we will have to look into it. Yeah. All right. So time is up. Thank you, Maxim. Oh, th th thank you. I think it uh, was a lot of useful information there for me. Thanks. All right. So the next session, which is the last one, is the uh, toolchain staff for kernel security, which is 
presenters are going to be Kiss Cook and, and King. So let me. Uh... Hi, Kiss. Hello. Here it is the slides. And I guess you are you starting or King is starting? I guess you are starting, right? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm starting, but I'm. Uh... Assume. Yeah, let here. me give you presenter. Now you are the presenter. Sensor power. Okay. Um, yeah. I'll so let me know when when King should step in, and then I will switch the presenter to her. Okay. Uh, Thanks. Close to the end. All right. Should I go ahead? Uh, hi. Uh, this is sort of. Now my standing talk uh, comparing sort of the compiler features that, that we're interested in for kernel security, uh, comparing what we've got between GCC and Clang. Um, I, there are a lot of links in these slides uh, just for reference and other stuff. Uh, so if you want to grab that URL uh, or download them from the plumber's site, um, now is a good time. Do you time. have it handy uh, to put it in the chat real quick? Oh, uh, sure. I should be able to type it. One types faster than me. Okay. That should be it. Thanks. Anyway, uh, I'll just uh, go ahead. So I'm going to skip a bunch of the common features or things that are user space specific that we don't want to Really go over and just dive right into the things uh, we do care about. Um, sort of a comparison between last year and this year. So these were the things I talked about last year and what was missing. Um, and different for this year is mostly on uh, the zeroing call used registers, the stack variable auto initialization, um, and the stack protective guard location pieces. And then this year, I care a lot more about array bounds checking. Um, and I have a new ridiculous idea that I'll talk about near the end. Uh, but anyway, I'll just go over each of these. And please jump in, like, just talk over me or pop up on the screen or try to chat and I'll try to pay attention to it. Um, so stack protector guard location. This is uh, mostly about having per thread stack canaries. Um, x86 for a long time was sort of cheating and using its thread local storage stuff that was really specific to x86. Uh, and we've slowly added a bunch of different architecture support for this with um, stack protector guard equals and then some specific details about individual registers that we want to do. <clears throat> and x86 actually grew this as well, and uh, the IA32 switched to it recently. Um, so if you try to build IA32, you don't get a stack canary uh, on, on like less than GCC8 on an IA32 build. But anyway, getting this across for all the architectures that we uh, want to be having a canary for would be nice. Um, so right now, GCC doesn't have this for ARM32, um, and neither does Clang. Uh, Clang needs it for RISC-V also. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, I386, people still build, but um, hopefully they're building on modern GCC or they're using very old kernels. Um, anyway, there are some associated issues with this, like leaving the canary value in the registers or spilling it to the stack. Um, I'm trying to track those at that issue. Uh, but ultimately, I just would like to get the support across all the architectures first. Um, zeroing call use registers. Uh, King did this for GCC, so we've got that now. Um, there are a couple open issues. Um, I think uh, she'll talk about that at the end here. Um, Clang needs this. There have been some attempts. I think I think I know of one person who's uh, still working on it, but I guess there's some infrastructure in Clang that's kind of missing to make this uh, makes it not so easy. 
Um, the kernel supports this since 515, um, and it's kind of a, an easy win on performance and image size, except on ARM64, which has to sort of blindly or clear two registers at every function return. So while it's perfectly fast, uh, it does make the image like 5% larger, which is significant. Um, but this is nice for, um, this got talked about earlier in the week, but it's good for blocking a lot of gadgets that end up in the kernel that are usable and it doesn't get rid of everything, but it gets rid of the, the bulk of really nasty stuff that's easy to use. Um, and so, it has, so, yeah, go on. So, okay, so you just mentioned the Arch64, also the kernel on Arch64 also uses this feature already. For uh, call use registers? Yeah. I yeah, it's any architecture that um, that supports the the GCC option. Uh, it'll it'll be enabled for. Yeah, I I just want to make sure you for the kernel. I remember you uh, there's a discussing on the on Arch sixty four. There are some performance issue with using this feature. So based on even on that performance issue, this feature is still used in the uh arch 64 for kernel uh so it's available is is what it is uh, oh so if you go look at um the, the configuration help on, on the kernel uh, it talks about you know check your workload like any other of these sort of instrumentation features mm. um, you know look at the resulting image size look at the, all of those all those pieces um steal the presenter oh Sure. Is there a way that I can mark this for download, Steve? I already did it for you. OK, thanks. Um, anyway, so yeah, it's it's basically people can investigate them, this for themselves. Uh, my goal is basically make things available. Um, and then distros and other end users sort of figure out if they want to if they want to do it or not. Um, let's see. So stack variable auto initialization. This uh, uh, King also did this uh, for GCC. Clang has had it for a little bit. Um, and this is, I think, probably one of the more important features we've had because this will just get rid of the, the vast majority of the uninitialized variable uh, on stack problems that we've had for, you know, decades. Um, and uh, it won't disrupt the W uninitialized coverage either. Um, this is already enabled by default in Android and Chrome OS. Um, and even though the, like Windows uses this for their kernel in VCC. Uh, uh, sorry, VC++. Um, so getting this in GCC is, is, is great. I'm really, really excited to have this for uh, the future. Um, most of the, Steve's asking, is there any measurable slowdown? For most of the workloads, there's basically no measurable difference. Um, there are some uh, sort of extreme situations where you can notice it. And there are, in fact, some situations where it actually speeds things up um, because it sort of uh, it primes the cache for, for that area, uh, which was a surprise to me, but anyway. Um, so again, people should check workloads, but overall, it is a it is a net win. Um, yeah, I, I agree. They should be on by default, but we'll we'll get there. First availability, then people play with it, then people ask why isn't this on by default, <laughs> and, and we can get there. Um, the 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 timing on that tends to be at a, a one year per. So we make it available in the kernel, and about a year later, all the distros have it on by default, and about a year later someone notices that all the distros have it on by default and we flip the default in the kernel. And that's sort of the way things that are uh, net wins have tended to go for us. Let's see. Um, okay, so now sort of, sort of an expanded topic from, I didn't really cover it much from last year, is uh, array bounds checking. And this is really getting into um, places where the compiler knows the size of an array, it's known at build time, um, and you can just insert checks for it. Um, uh, so, 
for years now, we've been slowly converting all the legacy zero and one element arrays into proper flexible arrays. Uh, the, the stuff that sits at the end of the structure for saying here, I've got a whole series of bytes. Um, and there's a bunch of different goals here. We want to keep the zero element arrays out of the kernel because we don't want, we don't want them to come back. Um, warn about overlapping weird uses of these things. Um, and fundamentally, the, the end goal is to never access beyond an array size. Uh, you know, if we know it at compile time, it's ridiculous that we would ever construct a situation where at runtime we can go beyond it or at compile time if we can see already that it's going to overflow, that we allow it to overflow. Um, and I'll go through each of these really quickly. Um, so the, the zero element arrays, you know, looks like this. We change it into a proper flexible array. Um, and we have, uh, we have some options as far, as far as keeping these out, keeping these from being reintroduced in the kernel. Um, Clang has the dash W zero length array, um, which is mostly about using one of them. Um, and I'd like to see this in GCC as well. We, we have this problem with the user API where we have to leave these old style uh, things in place because of old old code that's trying to build against it. So we can't just say that the kernel can't have them defined in any, in any structures, um, but if we can eliminate the use of any zero sized arrays in the kernel, um, detect that at build time, uh, then we can effectively keep it out. Uh, from the chat, rewrite the old code. Well, I mean, this is about user space old code, the user API or the headers that we export to user space. So, you know, getting uh, everyone to change their code everywhere. Yeah, that's that's the problem. Is there's APIs that are built this way. Um, anyway, getting this, I, I don't think should be too difficult. It's basically if you encounter a zero sized array use, freak out. Um, we also have uh, sort of deal with strange cases where there's overlapping uh, use. Um, of overlap of other other members. I don't know. We get into weird places where I'm trying to give an example here. Um, GCC has dash w zero length bounds, uh, which will warn about these kind of overlaps. Um, it would be nice if Clang gained that as well. Uh, it's not super critical because uh, we at least have, as long as we have coverage for these kind of static checks in at least one compiler, we generally will get the benefit for any, any build because it'll get changed in the kernel. Um, so let's see. We don't want to overflow our, our bounds. Now, normally, if we have a statically sized array bounds, we can catch those at, at compile time for the most part or instrument it so that we can check a dynamic offset. Uh, but our problem is with the actual flexible arrays. Um, there have been some proposals to uh, update the C language spec to include a dynamic size, uh, in, like to, sh to show what member is tracking the size of a given flexible array. Um, so in this example, you know, count is the one tracking how many elements uh, are, are present. Um, that would be nice. I'm hoping we might be able to do this, something close to this in the kernel with terrible macros. Um, Does so it anyway. have to be a local or, or, or member? Uh, so, so I'm looking for the general case, right? The, the bulk of uses in the kernel of flexible arrays, certainly not all. The, the common idiom is that you have some struct that uses a flexible array and tracks the size of it through another member. Um, there's a lot of different styles of this, but it basically boils down to that fundamental situation. I'm not saying we should change the C spec to require this. I, I, I would like to be able to um, specify it because, because, then because get... I'm, I'm thinking of number CPUs. We have a lot mm -hmm. of this stuff that is also depends on number CPUs right. one way or another. Right. And that, which is a global variable and not a member. Exactly. So, I mean, that's, that's an outlier, but, um, and I think that the the crazy macros I've got in mind for the kernel might be able to deal with a global. 
Uh, but as far as the general language and the places you know scattered throughout Wi-Fi drivers and all these places that do a ton of, uh, I guess it's serialization They're, and deserialization. They're taking some byte stream and shoving it into some series of structures. Usually, um, you know, it's it's a flexible array of structures that they have just deserialized out of some uh, byte stream. Um, so they they do attempt to track those lengths. They are in most places. Um, so a lot of places in the kernel can be, um, you can see this idiom repeated over and over and over. What What um, about uh, the allocation of whatever uses it? Is there a way to attach the allocate? Because you know, a lot of times you have a variable array like this. When you allocate yeah. it, you allocate the, rec the actual size. And then you say, OK, here's, I know we have macros to help do yeah. those allocations to calculate the size. Yep. Was there a way maybe we could attach some sort something that will then do a check that yep. says, oh, here's the size I get it, and then? Absolutely. That's that's what I've got, like, in the pipeline. I've got some helpers written that will do a, most of this work because it's always the same set of things that the kernel does. Like, in any of these places, it's figure out how many elements I have, figure out their size, how big do I need that, plus the structure in front of it, allocate that. Now copy from over here into there, but bounds check, you know, perform a loop in that amount to do all these things. So there's like these constant this repetition of the same idiom over and over and over um, and check for overflows and check for type overflows. Like instead of if that weren't size T count, if that were U8 count, um, you know, some places in the kernel don't validate that they're about to pull in, you know, fewer than can be stored in a byte. Um, so having a common helper for all of this uh, will be nice, or having it as part of the, the C language spec, uh, because then the compiler can do those checking, uh, can do that checking, and the runtime instrumentation now knows where to go find the answer. It can say, oh, I need to go check count to see how big this is. Um, reading chat here. No null term null terminated strings. I mean, yeah, there's there's a lot of other other situations, but um, the the one I'm trying to focus on right now is is the is the known sized arrays and the sort of common idiom flexible arrays where there's a instruct do, counter. Do we have a helper function for allocating? I, I know we have struct size mm -hmm. that's usually added to the length, and when you do the allocation, maybe we right. should have a specific you know, allocating function that we could then add whatever you want annotation to that yeah. says, you know, struct, you know, struct allocate, you pass the structure and then how many elements? And that's right. actually an allocation, something I'll allocate and not, you know, the flags. Yeah, that's, that's basically what I've got built um, now, but it depends on the, um, the, like the bunch of the array work and overflow work that um, did not get pulled this, this merge window. So I'm delayed by two months, but I'm still writing it. I expect to send it out soon. I just have to nail down a couple more pieces and get some more examples. There's a lot of weird corner cases where the, like the, the count is in another structure that is uh, you know, a, a parent of that structure. So there's like weird substructure situations, but um, getting it captured is not, is not my concern. It's mostly sort of, uh, you know, getting the compiler to understand this. Um, anyway, so the, the pieces at the bottom of the slide are uh, dash W array bounds will let us do compile time checks. It's very straightforward. If we have some array that has a specific size and we use a constant expression uh, to index it, the compiler will yell about it. Um, we're very, very close to having dash W array bounds work. Um, Steve asked about an, an attribute for the element. Uh, yeah, that's that's another uh, for for the size member or whatever. Yeah, that's another thought I've had. Something like that. I'd like to do something. I haven't been able to construct a macro that would be able to describe it though. Um, so sort of right now, every call site you have to repeat the same information. I'd like uh, some way to get at an attribute. But anyway, we'll get to that later. Um, so if an index is only known at runtime, uh, we can perform the runtime checking with dash f sanitize equals bounds. Um, and I'll move on. Um, so again, at compile time, we've got dash w array bounds. Um, there are some problems. 
So Clang pretends that zero and one element arrays are flexible arrays and doesn't enforce checks on those members, which is a problem. We have no way to actually do that. Um, so it, this means we can't find any of the last of these that might be hiding in corners uh, of the kernel. It should be easy to find them, but we keep tripping over them. Um, and GCC pretends that dereferences to zero and one element arrays are flexible arrays and does not enforce checks. Uh, and built-in object size in GCC thinks all trailing arrays uh, are flexible arrays, which completely breaks Fortify source depending on if you happen to have something at the end of your structure that is an array. Uh, you know, even if it's not a flexible array, you just have an array and it happens to be the last member, built-in object size can't see it. Um, that's, that's pretty terrible. Um, so I, I think it's important that we get both compilers to have a stop doing legacy flexible array handling. Um, I don't know if that's, I mean, I suspect it's part of dash pedantic, but we can't turn that on. Um, but we, we need something that we can turn this on and say, treat only flexible arrays as flexible arrays. Um, and then I think these bugs will go away. Um, so now we've got a rebounds checking at runtime. We've got uh, both GCC and Clang have the F, F sanitized bounds. Um, they have similar problems with the zero and one element arrays. Um, uh, GCC can disable this um, on the runtime, but not the compile time. Um, and Clang needs something like this as well. Uh, it would be nice, again, if it was just the single option that fixed this for compile time and runtime uh, that did the same thing. It just removed all the little workarounds that existed uh, for fake flexible arrays. Um, and for these kinds of sanitizers, it's still nice to have some way to control how we freak out uh, about runtime failures. Right now, our options are to warn, which doesn't actually stop the overflow, but will help us debug it, um, or, or trap, um, which is rather unfriendly. Um, I'd really like to be able to have a, a more friendly way to, to communicate to the compiler what sort of exception handling I want to do, um, instead of it just dropping um, an untracked UD2 or whatever to, to cause the trap. It would be nice if I could specify um, you know, use this chunk of assembly or something. So we could actually define the exception handling uh, for these kinds of sanitizer failures. Um, and then we could handle them gracefully or decide if we want to saturate or, you know, do whatever. Uh, let's see, I'm reading again, chat. Yeah, no, um, so Jacob's saying uh, the, the zero and one, uh, you know, turning off the, the fake flexible array is fine. Oh man, I gotta speed up. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't expect this to be a fault option. I just wanted to have an option so that we can turn on the kernel. Um, okay, built-in dynamic object size. Um, we can basically add more um, more knowledge to the runtime checking. Um, Clang has this, GCC had it discussed. Um, it would basically allow us to extend a bunch of the Fortify source stuff that we're already doing. Um, I'm going to skip on. Um, we've got signed overflow protection. There's an open bug that uh, we've been chatting about, but basically we have an incompatibility between uh, the sanitizer and what the kernel uses, which is no strict overflow. Uh, and we can't turn off the sanitizer using option attribute or uh, optimize attributes because they cancel all of the optimizer attributes. Um, so we haven't been able to use those. So we need some way to mix uh, the signed overflow protection. Um, also, there is explicit uh, reliance on this behavior of no strict overflow. Uh, yeah, of course. Or, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and those are the pieces that we want to be able to control because uh, we do use it in the kernel. So I can't just. I can't use one or the other. I have to use both, but I can't use both right now the way the, the compilers are built. Um, and unsigned, same thing. GCC doesn't have an unsigned overflow detector because it's not considered undefined behavior, yeah. which is fine. But uh, the, uh, the reason for that is uh, uh, in C, unsigned overflow doesn't doesn't exist. Right. Inside types uh, have a mode load, 
Yeah. You have to ma define semantics for it. Right. So this is less about like getting rid of undefined behavior, which is uh, a red herring. Uh, I, the issue is unexpected behavior. So we don't want, uh, we want to be able to know when we're expecting to wrap around. Um, and right now we have nothing that'll catch so, wrap around. So you were saying that people do not expect C programs to follow the C standard? Hmm? You're saying unexpected behavior, but it's defined behavior. Oh yes, I know, but yeah, it that, leads to bad situations. Yeah, there is a lot of defined behavior that is a bug. There's, there's undefined behavior, which is a class of problem um, that a lot of things come from, but there's also a class of problems that is just C, the language, and like the, the, the situation of math and us not checking for overflow. Um, and unsigned, in some situations we want to depend on the wrapping feature, yeah. and in many cases we do not. Wrapping is an unexpected situation that, while is legal, well, 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 you we don't want the kernel to do it. You shouldn't use the unsigned type then. <laughs> oh, really? That's what pointers are unsigned. Most of that, it comes from pointer math. Um, I'm going to speed up again because I don't have a lot of time. Um, uh, LTO, this exists. Um, there's, there's work to uh, get this for GCC in the kernel. And I know Andy continues to work on it. Um, I've seen him sort of chipping away at it, but I haven't seen a recent public uh, attempt at it, but it looks like there is a lot of shared infrastructure with the, the Clang LTO in the kernel. Um, so this is good. Um, I just would be curious to see uh, if there are other people working on this. Um, CFI, I'm gonna just skip on past. We have some in Clang. It would be nice to have a full blown uh, forward edge CFI in GCC. Um, right now, we mostly just got hardware support. Um, let's see, uh, backward edge. Um, we lost a software shadow stack on x86. Um, we're mostly just waiting for CET, but CET even in user space is still not landed. So I beg anyone who cares about CFI pieces to go test the series that's been proposed for the kernel um, and, and get Linux caught up. I mean, we're, we're shipping hardware with CET and the kernel just doesn't support it, um, which I, I find disappointing. Um, and this is the totally bonkers thing uh, that, that would help me with doing large rewrites in the kernel. Um, right now, we have a lot of instance equals kmalloc with some size or whatever else, uh, and then uh, rewriting all these so that we could take instance as an argument and use it as challenging in the kernel. But if we can refer to an L value or at least get the L value type uh, on the right side in the macro, we would be able to do some interesting stuff with uh, type segregated allocations and a bunch of other stuff. Um, I can get into this later if people have questions, but I'm Why can't we just make a macro that does it now and call your macro instead of kmalloc? Instead of uh, just- Because I don't want to replace 20,000 kmalloc instances. Like, Why not? Uh, it's been done it before. Sucks. It has been done a before. A script it's... can do it. Yeah, I mean, we literally have Clang Tidy is meant to rewrite your code, right? Like if you can automate a check, you can run Clang Tidy on a code base and have it mass rewrite stuff for you. I agree. There's I, mean, I can have Cox and Cosinel. Cosinel. Cosinel is Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I know how to do tree wide changes. The question, the problem is that everyone gets angry about tree wide changes and I. Yeah. Get them to Just think them. of your uh, commit count and how important you'll be when people go look at your uh, Git logs. Yeah, that's not important to me. Um, it's, I want to get, I want to get it done with as little friction as possible. Um, so, if we can do L value and introspection easier, um, then I don't have to do that. But sure, we could switch it around to do this instead. It's just a massive rework um, that. Uh, we've had a lot of pushback, like between all the work Gustavo does with refactoring, he, we've had things in the kernel that have taken, you know, four releases to do just because maintainers don't like having a, a mechanical change happen external to their tree. Um, but we could have done in a single tree wide hit at, at once. Um, people get pretty upset about it. Um, yeah, but once you get through it, it's there and it's done. I agree. And uh, as Nick is pointing out in the chat, there are going to be 
uh, people who object to the syntax at all. The fact that it has effectively, it appears to have a side effect as opposed to an assignment. Um, but anyway, this is just a fun idea that maybe we could do. Um, but it's further down on my list. Um, struct layout randomization, still bonkers. Um, there's a kernel plugin for this. Uh, it'd be interesting to have it in GCC natively. Clang has a proposed but stalled uh, version of this as well. Um, people use it, so I keep bringing it up. Um, there's Spectre v1 mitigation. It's really expensive in Clang. It'd be interesting to have a more targeted version of this in Clang and something for GCC. Um, Struct layout randomization works for dynamically loaded kernel modules, yes, because there is a single seed that is used for um, doing the randomization across all all build objects. So, so yes, artifact. yesterday there was this uh, GCCF analyzer talk and they mm -hmm. were looking at trust boundaries and that's mm -hmm. exactly what you need for Spectre as well. Exactly. Um, th that's that was what I was trying to talk about at the last bullet here is like we need to have some sense of reachability um, and that having having taint markings would be really nice for that because you can actually perform this kind of work against those taint marks. Um, okay, and now uh, this is, what's next? This is a, a King slide. I don't know how to give up. Yeah, I think it, it's okay just to put there. Uh, I think it's not too much from me. Yeah, you can just, uh, uh, yeah, for, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think for for me the major purpose for this talk is uh, just to try to get some uh, idea and suggestion on what's the next uh, important task uh, for the GCC uh, on the security feature. Yeah, to improve. Yeah, so that, that that's a uh, because currently I already finish uh, these two task two features so. I'm considering what's the next major uh, task to improve the GCC security. Yeah, so, but uh, right now, right now, I, I think I might uh, might work on the known issue first for this uh, in already in pre implemented feature. Yeah, as uh, Case mentioned, there are several open issue for the uh, pro you re register uh, wiping. There are one RFE, I believe that's for x86 x86 uh, to request uh, always use XOR uh, for the zeroing. Yeah, right now it's I, I believe it's use some move. Uh, yeah, use some move instruction. Yeah, so it's my not very uh, optical. Yeah, yeah, optimal. So. I think I will work on that one. And then the, there's another uh, compilation time error uh, for ARM. Yeah, so that's must, must be fixed next. Yeah. Uh, and there are also several other issues, open issues for the automatically variable initialization. That's a very new patch just committed into uh, GCC 12, yeah, two weeks ago. So uh, there are some open issues uh, there hasn't been fixed yet. So the first open issue is one missing warning, yeah, for the address taken variable. So that 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 issue we already know before I commit uh, this patch. Uh, we will we plan to fix this issue after the initial commit, yeah. And there are also some bugs uh, opened after the initial commit two weeks ago. Uh, right now, I believe there are four open bugs. Uh, three, yeah, I, I believe there are several open bugs already, part of them already fixed by uh, Richard Bernie, and there are still four open bugs uh, uh, right now. So I will work on those open bugs. Yeah, so next page. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so after fix those uh, open issues with uh, the, this, this uh, new fee, two new features, I'm considering what's the next one uh, for GCC. So as Case just mentioned in previous slides, 
uh, from my understanding, maybe the the yeah, there are several issues might be important. Uh, the first one is uh, adjust the signed integer overflow detector to work with the uh, F wrapper. So that one maybe uh, it's not very hard to to do. Maybe just adjust uh, other attribute in the in the GCC, and then these two can work together for uh, Linux uh, for the kernel's use, right? Okay. If we add a, a, a function level, add a yep. function level attribute, yeah. Yep. Mm. Okay, yeah, so that one, yeah. And then next one is uh, uh, another task is uh, provide an option to turn off the GCC heuristic or trading array, a uh, flex array. Then the bump checking can work as expected. So I believe uh, Jacob in the in the chat chat area mentioned it's durable uh, because we, we need an option, but it's not on by default. So uh, the default behavior still trade trade all the trading array and flex array. So it will not break the existing application. But at the same time, a kernel can have this functionality available. Uh, for more security purpose, so so that's uh, the next one. And after that, maybe the unsigned overflow detection. So that might be a quite 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 a lot bigger project compared to the uh, previous two. So yeah. So what else? <laughs> what else? Any suggestions? <laughs> Just pick pick the less controversial one. <laughs> <laughs> I think these will keep keep uh, folks busy. Um, but yeah, anyone else have thoughts or ideas or things they would like? Please uh, speak up. Oh, Randy brings up a good one. I've run into too is having. Um, Warn and errors. The compile time warn and errors print out values from from that instance. I, I've run into that with at least the like compile time warning and compile time error. I don't have a way to include. Uh, you know, usually it's some state that I got into. I can't. I have no way to express the state other than you hit this check. Not what were the values of this check. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. All right. Um, well, if anything else comes up, uh, we can do stuff offline. Um, that, that's it. Here's the slide link again and how to reach us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Case, another yeah. question. Um, yeah. For some of these things that, that you mentioned, do you have bugs filed for a bunch of these? They're just I th issues or? I think I should have bugs filed for everything I mentioned. I tried to go back mm. through here and get bugs filed. They should be linked if I don't have something. Yeah. The, the, uh, yeah. the one with the frowny faces in the comments, that one was the one I was curious about. Frowny faces, which? <laughs> don't I have a bunch <laughs> every, of frowny faces everywhere? Every slide. <laughs> this one. Yes, yeah, this, no, one no. this one, this one, this one, this one. Yep. Coming back. Here you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the with caveats, uh, I think. And the uh, trailing arrays of unknown size, I think, are both uh, both existing bugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the the thing that's most interesting on on our side is, uh, given the resources we have, how do we prioritize um, shipping? And you know, there's probably mm -hmm. a bunch of things broken, and so it's also useful for us to have kind of a some signal of like what's the the value compared to how much work it is to implement, kind of thing. Right, and and. I have I have trouble prioritizing that because I don't know how much work is necessary uh, on some of these things. Um, you know, I don't know if there's a single place in the compiler that says, "Is this a fake flexible array?" and you just add one check there, or is it you know scattered throughout? Because the latter sounds like a lot harder to fix. Um, bounds checking stuff would would be nice to have it sort of all 
standardized and working uh, just because there are so many little corner case bugs that I keep tripping over. It's really hard to have a, a common working framework that we can you know, follow a specific set of rules within the kernel and, and get the right behavior. Hi. Uh, uh, Hi. Uh, could, could you please file a GCC bug for the zero length array? Uh, I, th I think it is. Thanks, Bill. How do we respond? Okay. I think so, yeah. Um, let's see. Like the, the with caveats one should be, I think, the link to that. But I, I can drop it in chat too. Anyway, cool. Please email us or or something if you want to chat more. But thank you. Cool. So uh, we want to thank all of our presenters today, um, everyone that, that put together a great talk, folks that stopped by and had, had questions and feedback for, for everyone. Really, the goal of Plumbers is to try to get uh, like minds together in a room, even if it's virtually. Um, never enough time to, to sort out everything in person, but definitely a, a good start and um, gives us topics to follow up on for sure kind of thing. So thanks again to all of our presenters, folks asking questions, um, my co MC chair, Jose, and of course, there's tons of work that goes on in the background, uh, planning for plumbers and infrastructure and so much happens behind the scenes that that folks are kind of none the wiser of when things go smoothly kind of thing. So, you know, big thank you to all those folks. And of course, the event sponsors, um, as well, it does take quite a bit of funding to run all the infrastructure and everything. So um, thanks again, everyone. Uh, if you have questions, we do have the mailing list um, for Linux tool chains is something to, to check out. Um, kind of trying to keep topics that are interesting maybe to some compiler vendors and kernel developers as well. Um, and there's a closing keynote in about 12 minutes if folks are, are interested. Um, is there anything else that that we're missing here, Jose, or you think we're all set? <clears throat> I think we can wrap it up. Great. All right. Thanks again for your time, everyone. And well, uh, hey, we'll thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you guys are sharing notes or taking notes or not. Yep. I have been yep, in the chat. It. Please save them. There's the double little arrows up on top. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep, I got I a copy. Yes. Uh, we'll be. I will be uh, coming back to pester you guys for a write up of everything that's uh, happened throughout the MC, and I'm on the hook for my own MC too. Is it possible to export the chat as well, or just the notes? Yes, I will go through. It takes a bit of work. It's not trivial to do that. I will go in and do that, and I'll send it. I will send you a copy. Cool. Elena says she has them as well. Okay. If Elena has it, then. There, have her send them to you. <laughs> Save me the work. <laughs> cool. All right, I'm just going to blast out the uh, the notes to the mailing list right now, kind of thing. So we have them at least, you know, in case okay. my machine goes nice. down or something. <laughs>
And again, thanks very much to the sponsors of this year's Linux Plumbers Conference 2021. Uh, Facebook as a diamond sponsor, we greatly appreciate all the incredible support that Facebook has given this year. Platinum sponsor, IBM. Gold sponsorship by ARM and Microsoft. Great support is silver sponsors, AWS, Amazon, Netflix, and Red Hat. Thanks to Colabora for the speaker's gift sponsorship and to VMware for the t-shirt sponsorship. Uh, thanks to Linux Foundation for providing conference services to this and to the great team of uh, planning committee for the Linux Plumbers Conference 2021, chaired by David Woodhouse, Elena Zanoni, Keith Stewart, James Bottomley, Christian Browner, Jonathan Corbett, Guy Lunardi, and Steve Rosette. Thanks very much for all of your help and see you at the uh, wrap up at the end of the conference. <laughs>